the August 21st regular governing board of education meeting for the Vallejo City Unified School District is now called to order. The board met in closed session and no decisions were made. Roll call, please. Trustee Waterman? Present. Trustee Mumson? Present. Trustee Stewart? Here. Vice President Ubaldi? Here. President Wilson? Present. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I've made the report already comes for closed session. I'm sorry I did it early. Uh, no decisions were made. Student discipline, re-admit student 2013-R1. Madam President, I'm very happy to uh, make the motion to re-admit student F2003-R1. Second the motion, Madam President. It has been moved and seconded that student F 2013-R1 should be readmitted. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Student is readmitted. Adoption of the agenda, item 4.1. Are there any addition, corrections, changes to the agenda? If none, I would move to approve. Second. It has been moved and seconded that the uh, agenda is adopted as printed. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The agenda is approved as printed. Moving on to uh, 5.1, are there any staff reports? I apologize, President Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, we have a public comment on 4.3.1, is that correct? Okay, thank you. Are there any staff reports? Good evening. Good evening. Okay, we have a, well actually, uh, I was gonna do this for um, Gigi Patrick, our HR uh, certificate of staffing vacancies. She has a, little information that she would like to provide as far as the uh, staffing right now for certificated. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So our current update for the certificated staffing vacancies are the following. At the high school, we have a total of 9.2 FTE, that's both high schools. At the middle school, it's a total of 3.6 FTE. And at the elementary, it's 13 FTE, and this includes the additional five um, vacancies that we have now as a result of the new LCFF formula and a 1.5 non-teaching classroom FTE, and that's for two schools. One school has a 0.5 support teacher position, and another school has a 1.0 teacher leader vacancy. For timelines, we have our elementary um, school sites which have been given multiple subject candidates to consider. That information was sent to them today. For um, our middle school multiple subject, they also received information for their multiple subject vacancy. And for high school, um, those are mostly math and science positions that um, actually close on Friday. And this is a new pool that was created as a result of us 
hiring so many math and science folks early on in the summer, so we exhausted all of the candidates. So we opened a pool again, and it closes Friday. And then they will be given that information so that they can select applicants. Our recruiting, interviewing, and hiring will continue until all of our vacancies are filled. So it is an ongoing process, and daily we are hiring, we are recruiting, and we are interviewing qualified teachers. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Patrick. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other staff reports? Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. I have a staff report on transportation update. Um, this is a good time just to talk about it. This has been a, uh, you know, we've changed from uh, last year to this year by reducing uh, our, our, our routes mm -hmm. as well as our stops. And uh, it's been taken off pretty good. We have a few schools that, um, that have been, um, um, we have a few problems because of communications that haven't gone out. I mean, they, were, they went out, but we've had some communication problems as far as every parent knowing what's going on. And that was, we have a lot of at Cave and at, at Highland. This year we have approximately seven uh, routes. Uh, we had um, somewhere, I think it was almost doubled last year. Um, the routes consist of stops. The stops have also been um, reduced as well um, so that they can basically deal with, um, you know, uh, uh, let's call uh, centralized areas. So um, out, of the, uh, out of the 28 routes that we have, uh, seven of them are regular routes, or regular ed routes, and the rest, the 21, are special ed. Um, just to give a little bit of data on that, um, the seven routes um, that we're talking about, that's 32 stops. Again, these are, these are routes that specifically address all our safety issues regarding crossing of, you know, Highway 80, 29, uh, and 37, as well as, you know, Sonoma is 29. So all those major um, areas that we wanted to make sure that our students got to school safely um, addressed these, these routes. So out of the, 30, out of the 32 stops, we're, we're, we're um, transporting currently right now about 498 students under the regular ed, regular ed routes. Under uh, the special ed routes, um, there's, like I said, there's uh, there's 21 of those um, routes, and there's 470 stops. So you can see, and that's translating to 500 students. So mm -hmm. our special ed routes are the ones that are really um, uh, uh, take uh, the highest precedence. And again, when you compare 32 stops to 470, uh, 470 stops, you can see what the big difference is. And the special ed are being addressed with um, uh, the IEPs that they've been assigned. The IEPs consist of if it's a corner stop or a door, um, basically uh, we call it uh, a house stop. A house stop is when individually they get picked up. So again, if you have a corner stop that you normally have 10 students, uh, a door stop means that you would have 10 separate houses that you would have to stop to. So that's the reason the difference is there. There's um, uh, a lot more information on this, what the routes look like. It uh, pretty much looks like almost like a, a BART color code type of a setup. So um, at a future meeting or whatever, we could get that information out to you or we just get it out to you um, at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Any more uh, staff? And um, I uh, should have announced this at the beginning of the meeting that uh, VCAT lost the connection um, and they are working on it. Um, we are live on our website, and uh, but VCAT is taping, and we will be broadcast Saturday at noon. So um, this is so just letting the public know, and they are working on uh, the live um, connection to get that back up. Yes, I have a question for Mel in regards to the. Um, bus routes and such. Uh, I'm at the early stages, here we are at the beginning of the school year and we've, we're at the place where we've reduced our busing down to the absolute minimum that has ever been true, at least for quite a long time. Do we have any mechanisms in place 
to pay attention to the tardiness and the absences of students in relation to the distance that they have, that they live from school. Um, I'd need a mathematician to be able to articulate what I'm really trying to get at. Yeah, but, I'm, you know, of course, the concern is always that as the onion goes farther and farther out, the rings go out farther away from the school, technically they're allowed to be here and still get there by themselves. But are we concerned that with the lack of busing, I mean, we are concerned with that with the lack of busing there might be problems in getting our, or the kids might be more likely to be absent or tardy. My question really is, do we have a way to, to pay attention to that, to study that this year to see if there's any truth to that concern or um, any, uh, something we might want to pay attention to? Dr. Bishop. Yes, so um, this year we're implementing something called ARIES Analytics and it's a robust ARIES program where we are monitoring and tracking a number of indicators that lead to either success for students or lack thereof. And one of those things is chronic absence. So we'll be able to, the principals will automatically, based on the formula, be able to see those students that are chronically absent and then go back and address. It may be an SST meeting where they call the parent to the table to find out what the issue is or in the case of middle and high school, we'll automatically know um, whether or not transportation is the issue. Um, we had a number of those kinds of issues last year, and we were able to rectify them either through a partnership with Soul Trans or um, other mechanisms. So this year, Aries Analytics, and one of the things we're monitoring is chronic absence. Thank you. I'm, I'm that is exactly the question I asked. I know that we're trying to make sure we don't allow our children to drop through the cracks, and I'm glad to know that we have some sort of system in place so that we can analyze it at a later date. Thank you. Director Stewart. Thank you. Mel, I'm looking on the district website at the, uh, the high school busing zones, and I know we've gone back and forth a bit on uh, to what degree we allow the area North Phileo to continue going to Bethel High School. Um, what is the status of that? I, I believe my initial understanding was we were going to allow, for a better lack of term, a grace period of students who were existing at a school site to continue going to the school they were attending. But we're showing here um, a portion of, I guess you would call it, um, the areas of College Park, the crest in the area above uh, Cimarron and whatnot, um, going to Bethel High School. Um, which is on the west side of the freeway. Um, and I know there's plenty of kids from that area that go to Bethel, but one, to clarify the, the zones, but two, how are we handling that moving forward? Because it was my understanding that the freeway was the divider. Well, I, I may need to uh, get back to you on that. I know that on the Bethel, we are still picking up the north um, Vallejo students. Um, and, and, and take them to Bethel. Um, and reason there's a, there's a route that takes, there's one route that takes care of that area because it goes all the way up to Hiddenbrook. So there's a, there's a big uh, circle that picks them up and brings them down. And also for those students that have to go to Loma Vista and Wiedemann. So we are addressing, so I don't know if there's a, if there's a void that, you're, that you see, then we may need to address that because it could be on the same, the same circle to pick them up. Because we are, we are taking the best of Bethel. Yeah, that is also my concern mm -hmm. because um, at this point in time, that should not be happening because when we set the boundaries, that um, I think we're into about five years now, that it was the grace period. They were grandfathered in, and um, uh, with if they were already attending, and then with the closure of Hogan, we also made uh, that. La you know, and then siblings going to the same school. But now that should not be happening. Well, you let and me get back to you on the actual timeline because I think that there was a year difference in that. So I'll, I'll have to get back t to see what that actual time period is because, yeah, because those students that were in the school should have evolved out. But I think there's a, there's a, a gap there. So, And if they ask for open enrollment, then it's my understanding that they should then be provide their own transportation. Correct. Uh, because they're saying that the, we want to attend this school and we can provide, we can get there. Um, so um, 
Uh, yeah, again, I think that's very important. Right. Again, the, but again, there's no students should be going over on that on the Bethel side. I mean, they should but have evolved out. Yeah. So we need to a, take a look at that timeline because I think there was a um, a difference in timeline. We want to make sure those that started, let's say they were the let's say the charter members, mm -hmm. uh, that charter membership should be over at a certain time period. So we need to verify what that is. But any new students that would be coming in would be uh, no longer needing that transportation, except for those that are out there in Hiddenbrook, I would think. Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, thank so you. So the follow-up comment I had for that, you know, that comment was the fact that you know, we're showing it, we're depicting it as part of the Bethel area on our district map. So we would just want to make sure we could get that figured out um, quickly. Um, also looking at the middle school maps, at using the example of the Hogan map, I'm going to use Glen Cove as the example. We have a small portion of Glen Cove outside of the two and a half mile or two and a quarter mile radius. Um, to what degree are we receiving comments from parents that are close to that boundary um, and wondering whether or not they can receive service? Because it's, it's a very small section of Glen Cove that's outside of it, but if we have a bus going out there, to what degree are we having a, a, a bit of leniency? And if we're going to allow some there, how do we handle it? The way we be, well, the way we will address it, the way we have been addressing is that the established stop that's established if there's if there's an individual or a parent or a student that's outside of you know the zone, they just need to get to that stop. The stop that's been established. We're not going to establish any new stops, but if they get to that stop they will be able to get transportation. And we're also getting our passes that will be out within the next uh, month or so. We're still getting that together. So they would just be able to have that pass to get to that stop to get to the school. But in terms of families that are not eligible but very close and there's a stop, you know, like, we're using uh, a metric based on as the crow flies, correct? And in this case, none of our students are actually flying to school, and so some of them might be traveling further than others, now especially you know in an well, hey, yeah. if they, <laughs> so for instance, you have Glen Cove Parkway that loops around and goes up the hill and whatnot, and for some of these kids, they'll be within the two and a quarter miles, but over three miles away from school, as an example, and so I'm just curious how we're handling or we'll, we'll have to take a look at that. Case or we yeah, we'll have to take a look at that because the, th the thing is, is that if they got to the stop that's established, the thing that really saved a lot of the uh, the cost here, we'll have to see what the uh, ridership is. I don't think there's a full ridership. There's 84 there are 84 passenger buses, and I don't think that bus is full. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's somewhere around 50 students. Or I, I have to verify first that. come first served is how we're gonna. So they would just get get to the stop, and then they would get to the school. Okay. And we also um, are trying to establish, um, we do have what you call an, an overflow service that we're dealing with Mare Island, so we might be, there's some free time to where one of those buses could swing back around and pick up the overflow that would be greater if there's a greater need based on that, that uh, scenario that you just mentioned. Sure. And the main reason I bring it up is because, as you know, the, fo the Soul Trans Route 14 went away this year because of this service. And for the borderline families, um, it may be a, a, a concern. Uh, they can use local routes to get to school, but it'll require them to go much earlier. And if they see this bus going by and it's not full, we want to make sure we're serving the, the families as best we can. I agree. And I think that, again, I really appreciate everyone's patience out there in the community regarding this change. It's a, 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 a substantial change. And we'll make, we'll, you know, as we take a look at it and adjust, um, we're going to have a little few bumps along the way. But again, I think it's, it's between the uh, uh, what with the changes and the changes that uh, Soul Trans has put in place and other elements of the awareness of parents is carpooling and things like that. I think we'll be really successful as we start to really, um, you know, move forward. And we'll just keep keeping an eye on the target there. Any other comments? Any other staff reports? If not, we'll move to 5.2, community members. Crystal Watts. Good 
Good evening, board and superintendent. Um, Crystal Watts, VEA president. And um, I am reading, I am wearing readers. <laughs> I've come to accept that inevitable thing that happens in everybody's life. Um, I just wanted to first acknowledge um, the attendance of our superintendent and a couple of, a, of the school board members at the um, at, at our founding convention for Common Ground back in June. I had not done that publicly, so I really wanted to thank you guys for coming to that event. I, I see it as a really positive thing that's going on, not only in Vallejo, but Solano County and Napa County. The thing that I've always told folks is that too often we tend to isolate ourselves and that it's very easy if you live in a community that's not Vallejo to think that it's just Vallejo's problem, but the reality of it is is that Vallejo's problem is Fairfield's problem, it, um, is Napa's problem, um, and our successes as well. So I think it goes both ways. So I really do appreciate um, the attendance of board members and the superintendent at that meeting. Last Friday we had our VEA breakfast. It's the first one we've done. Um, when we brought up this idea, I guess they used to do it regularly back in the 90s. And so we had about 200 of our members show up for free breakfast um, to, welcome to welcome them to the new school year. And so I was really pleased to see them. And um, board member Ubaldi also showed up. There was an unfortunate thing at the beginning um, where one of, one of our folks was a little bit zealous in trying to keep people who he felt didn't belong from coming in, so I wanted to publicly apologize again to um, board member Ubaldi for that misunderstanding. We did appreciate you being there. Um, over the past month, I wanted to also thank Hattie Kogami and um, Human Resources because they have been instrumental in letting us know when we have new teacher orientation so that we can be part of that process and welcome um, our new teachers and um, educators to Vallejo City Unified. You may have noticed I I'm wearing a, v a new VEA shirt. We have a VEA store. So if you want VEA swag, it's gonna be on our website. Um, it comes through Cafe Press, so if you, if you want to um, wear some cool VEA clothes that are maybe uh, more to your liking than our current VEA shirts, then you're welcome to, to purchase it. And we do get, it's kind of a fundraising thing, and so we'll be putting money um, towards our scholarships. Every year we um, grant scholarships to uh, kids of our teachers, um, and so this will be going towards that. Um, so far, the reports that I'm hearing from a lot of our teachers um, is that everything's gone um, off to a great start, and so I'm really, really pleased about that. Our first Chevy, please, thank you. Our first Chevy Social is on Monday, September 9th. Um, school board members, you're welcome to attend. Superintendent, you're welcome to attend. This is kind of a fun e event. Um, I've let every one of our new teachers know about, so I'm hoping that's gonna be a huge success. We feed you and we provide you non-alcoholic beverages, um, margaritas you have to pay for. I also wanted to acknowledge the start of the Algebra Success Academy. This is something that was developed out of Twin Rivers Unified School District and we're bringing it to Vallejo with the help of our superintendent, um, CTA and VEA and the district. We're all working together to make a solid foundation um, in algebra for our elementary students. And I think that is it for me. So thank you very much. And are there any questions? What's the date on that? Might have passed it in, mm -hmm. What's the date on that? September 9th. Monday, September 9th from 3.30 to 6. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Robert Sussel. I, I want to talk about the last two weeks. Your actions not to put up the August 7th meeting on your website kind of confirms what some of the critics feel about the lack of transparency. Okay, do you want me to start over? 
your actions not to put up the August 7th meeting kind of confirms what many of the critics have felt about the school board not being as transparent as you should be. And it, I remind people that the school district made no effort to stream the meetings or place them on the internet prior to being uh, publicly prodded by the VIT B team of Mr. Garman and myself. And I realize this week you're starting to stream live, but I would ask why'd you wait until 2 p.m. today to announce it? Why didn't you uh, make an announcement several days ago so that people would be aware of it? Uh, you know, there's, you have a very small audience at, on VCAT. And I would also remind you when the school board had their July 10th meeting, it was put up on YouTube by the school district, but you cr quickly reverted to your old ways. When, when I asked Mr. Cheap, who was the head of IT here, about the August 7th meeting, when it would be available, he told me that his supervisor, Dr. Ramona Bishop, had instructed him not to upload any more school board meetings to YouTube. I might add that YouTube is free, offers easy access. Instead, he was instructed to stream it from the school's website. And I would say putting on the school's website will likely eliminate the possibility of being able to embed the meeting on other websites. Also, very few people can watch it live at 5 p.m. like tonight. Also, VIB was able to obtain a video on August 7th and through the Public Records Act and had it up on YouTube within a couple hours. And I, I would really note that although two weeks have passed, the August 7th meeting is still not available on the school's website. And it was only due to the efforts of VIB that there's any place that you can look at it. And were the members of the board aware of what transpired? I realize the superintendent is the administrator makes the final decisions, but I would hope the board communicate with Dr. Bishop about what occurred. And I would have two questions for Dr. Bishop. Why'd you stop, decide to stop using YouTube when it's free, easy to upload, easy access, and many school districts are using it? And, you, and being able to stream it live to the web is not a good reason in this case because it's at a, these meetings that are an inconvenient time. And secondly, when you found out that VCAT couldn't stream it that night, why didn't you immediately put it up on YouTube until your IT department could figure out how to put it on your website? And lastly, I would also like to know when you're going to change your meeting time so that your meetings are more accessible to the public. The 5 p.m. meeting time does not show a commitment to access or transparency. Thank you. Mustafa Abdulghani. I'm here uh, today to discuss the fact that this year, uh, this year, 64% of the third grade class, the class of 2022. Uh, was unable to demonstrate proficiency when the class took the Star English Language Arts test uh, this spring. Uh, that 64% failure represents 703 students who the community feels were not sufficiently uh, um, supported. When the class of 2022 took the Star test in, uh, for the first time in second grade, 50% of the class, or 587 students, were unable to demonstrate proficiency. What this shows is an increase from 50% to 64%, from 587 students to 703 students who uh, the community feels have not been sufficiently supported toward demonstrating proficiency. The class of 2022 started the second grade in September of 2012. This was less than a month after the board adopted an equity goal of all students performing at grade levels on third grade STAR testing. Since the board completed this adoption, the community has closely watched the progress of this class and is concerned with the movement toward the attainment of this goal. The community feels that the parents of these students are very concerned with their children's progress and are deserving of the kind of support to demonstrate that concern. The question for you, Madam President, is this. Uh, whether the board might consider placing the progress of the class of 2024 on the board's agenda, similar to the way it put the grand jury report on every agenda, as evidence to the community of the sincere concern the board has for the attainment of the third grade testing goal. 
Star Testing Go. The class of 2024 is the second grade class that will take the star test for the first time in 2014. It's the second grade class that is start, uh, starting this, uh, sep this, this year. The belief is that placing a discussion of this class's progress on every agenda will serve as a motivating factor, which analysis of the district's work indicates should be an important consideration in the attainment of third grade star testing goal. Um, I'd like to ask that my remarks be placed mm -hmm. in the minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Levy? Levy. Levy. I'm sorry. Members of the board, Dr. Bishop, my name is Sue Levy and I've been a teacher in Vallejo for 31 years, I think it is. Um, I teach currently at Independent Study and we had a great beginning this year. Uh, we have, we're up to six teachers and we really are excited about that. And um, we, all the kids started on Monday and we divided them up into their classes and they're all starting. We have a few that had their babies over the summer and a few that are having their babies soon. Um, we have kids who are, uh, have to work full time. We have kids who are having difficulties in the regular comprehensive high schools. Um, maybe they're feeling bullied, maybe they are bullies. Um, we have kids coming off of being down at the Vallejo Education Academy and this is sort of like a transition period for them to, be, to have that one-on-one -on -one with a teacher. Our goal is for them always to go back to their comprehensive schools but uh, some of them do wind up graduating actually from independent study. My concern for you this time is due to a change in policy, um, the adult school is no longer taking high school students at, under concurrent enrollment. Our students would often be deficient in credits and we would send them to the adult school to make up an English class or a history class, um, which was really beneficial. Um, Without them being able to go to the adult school, the only option left for them is to go to the college, which are much more difficult classes for them to take. Which, so it gets really hard for our kids. Like I have a senior right now, she's her fourth year, she needs 115 credits to graduate. There's no way she can take 115 credits from me. So without having the adult school to go to to get some credits, she's really in a difficult place. We're not supposed to keep them for a fifth year so basically we're, we're just sending them off without a diploma, which is not what I think you all want. The other concern is um, what I would like at least to be able to do is send them if they're 18. We have a lot of seniors who are 18 in their fourth year and technically at 18 you're an adult. So I would like to at least have the 18 year olds be able to go to the adult school um, and take the, the one or two classes they need to get through that last year. Um, I think we all want the kids to graduate, want, we want them to be successful, and it seems like we're putting another barrier in their way. So if at all possible, I'd like you to consider it. And like um, my colleague Crystal said, we've had a good first beginning of the year. It was very positive, and we're looking forward to a great year. Thank you. Dr. Bishop. Um, just quickly, Ms. Levy, if you would just send me a reminder email and I'm going to put you, you and your administrator in touch with the people who are planning credit recovery. Thank you. It just will not occur at the adult school, but it will occur. Okay, thank you. There is a process uh, that um, they aren't just thrown away. There is a credit recovery option. Mark Garman. Hi, first I'd like to thank the school board for taking a step in the right direction for meeting transparency and starting the live streaming since we last spoke. So I do appreciate that. Um, I, I just heard that it, it's failing to stream on VCAT. Well, I can tell you the file that I got that I requested of the last meeting was in PAL standard, which is the standard in Europe. That would definitely cause it to not stream on VCAT, okay, because it's 25 frames a second. We don't use that in the United States. So that might be something you want to check. Um, also, I have a question. Uh, will the streaming footage be archived so that it can be viewed uh, after the meeting? It will be. So that will be up on, the on, on your website. OK. Um, other question is, 
will the streaming footage be embeddable? Do you know, or should I ask your IT department that? Somebody who knows that one. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I do want to say, Mr. Garman, also that the, um, um, every Saturday, so after the board meeting occurs, mm -hmm. that Saturday at noon, there's going to be a replay on VCAT. Okay. So just so everybody who can't watch it at this time or doesn't have internet capability, they can watch it at VCAT at noon right. on Saturday. Yeah, and I mean, we're, we're gonna continue to put the, the meetings up on uh, YouTube, right. you know? I mean, I don't know why um, you guys aren't doing that as well, uh, because it's a very shareable format that, you know, people can put it on their Facebook and so on. Uh, but if the school, school district is not, that's fine. Uh, you know, we're gonna put it up there <laughs> at any rate. Yeah. Thank you. And it, there's, I don't know if you guys followed it, but there's there's quite a lot of interest, maybe more than you imagine. Once it gets out there and people are able to see it, there's a lot of interest on the school board meetings. Um, so, you know, hopefully you should check the uh, the format that's being sent because that was just weird the last time. Because I looked at it and I'm like, oh, this plays in Europe. Isn't that something? And that would, like I say, definitely prevent it from streaming on VCAT. So hopefully, maybe that's the problem. Okay, I suspect it might be. And, you know, that's about it, really. Uh, we'll just continue to put it up, and, uh, you know, thank you guys for, for taking a step in the right direction. Appreciate that. And uh, mm -hmm. I, can I give you my the request for the, the footage? Can I hand that in? Is that all right? Yes. All right. Thank you. Director Waterman. Thank you. And I just want to take the, this moment to thank Mr. Garman for being such an advocate for making sure that the public really understands what goes on in this room. I know that... Um, it's a difficult thing for us to do the kind of outreach that the city deserves and needs. And uh, the more enthusiasm and the more attention that we get, the more I realize that the community is going to understand the serious work that's going on in this room. So thank you very much for helping us out with that. Director Ubaldi. Mr. Garman, I, um, as you know, I'm uh, involved with VCAT, and I will follow up on that. And and determine if that's that's the issue. It's the issue. Uh, okay. 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 Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And we definitely have no reason not to be transparent, and uh, we appreciate the public at any time, um, uh, whatever input. We're always open and welcome to it. Uh, Berkey World. President, members of the board, uh, I'd like to thank you for not going through the Vallejo's Burning website. You don't need to go through them. And they're not the ones that have been down here many times asking the meetings to, asking for these meetings to be done publicly. They're Johnny come lately to this. So it's not them that's pushing this. And you have had it for many years on, uh, on TV. So there's been transparency down here for these meetings a lot of times. Uh, it all started way back in 94 when Leanne Tidd, we had Leanne Tidd's husband come down here with a hand handheld uh, video taper and we taped them and had them uh, put on the proper format so it could get onto the uh, uh, pu uh, public access TV. As for all these people who are making comments, if you go to the Vallejo is Burning website, they're all anonymous or some persuade or name, you have no idea who it is. It could be two people making all these comments under different names. You know, I get tired of hearing, oh, there's so much. Look at all these people, what they're saying. Again, you have no idea who it is to say. They ain't got the backbone to use their name and come down here and say something. I don't take any stock in what they say. Because uh, it's very easy for somebody to make a dozen different names up and say, oh my gosh, look at all the people that are talking. When it's not really, it's only one or two people, maybe. There's no way of knowing who these people are that are talking. Excuse me, Mr. Garman. Do you mind? Mr. Garman. Do you, well, I'm up me, here, Ms. you can come say whatever you want. Mr. Whirl and Mr. Garman. <sighs> Mr. Garman, you had your time. It's Mr. Whirl's turn. Okay. Go right people ahead. can make whatever comments they make. I know I've made a lot down here, and nobody's hauled me off to jail. I've never seen anybody who's come down here 
that made a comment be hauled off to jail. So as I say, these people can't put their name on something that I don't look at them as, as, as people and people that don't really care if they are in fact certain people. So if you do need help getting it on, like the city does, how many times, and this is an election year for the Spoil City Council, and you will hear every candidate say, oh, we want to work with the school district. Well, call a few of those people up and get them to work with the city and find out how they, how they do it and do it just like the city does, where everybody can see it while the meeting's going on and it's archived. I know you're working the best you can. Just need a little bit more work, and it'll be taken care of. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have come a long way from the VHS to Berkeley. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> okay. Um, and we appreciate, as I said, all the comments. Everybody has the right to say what they like. Um, and uh, we have no reason not to be transparent. Um, Wanda Wilson. Good evening. Good um, evening. I came here. You can pull it down a little. I came here two years ago. Um, my daughter was in the eighth grade, and she was going to Hogan Middle School, as we call it now, which came from Springtown. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have uniforms. So I came and asked you guys to please help them get uniforms. And you guys did. And I wanted to thank you guys and the teacher, Mr. Carrasco, also wanted to thank you and our board, um, Band Booster Board wanted to thank you. So what I did was I did a, got a photo taken of them and I got it framed and I would like for you guys to have it to display in the hallways or wherever you guys see mm -hmm. fit it to let people know that the board does listen and that you guys came to our help to help the kids with their uniforms. I mean, the kids that next year that the kids were in those uniforms, I'm telling you, the look on their faces was amazing. Mm -hmm. It gave them such pride to see that they look like the rest of the guys out there marching down the street. So I wanted to give you guys a picture of the band in their new uniforms. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's great. Sorry. Wonderful. Yeah. So if anybody want to see it, you guys can yes. And I'm sure. Thank you. And I Welcome. guarantee you Thank that you. we will um, Thanks for everything. We will find a place Thank in our hallways you. to um, display this because Thank this is excellent. And we really appreciate the fact that um, you, are, you know that we did hear yes. you. And... Yes. Um, we uh, support you. Uh, Director Waterman. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, we've got a lot of committed parents in this district, and I know that I, I might step on some toes, but I'm not sure that there's any parent like a band parent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I'm not even at Hogan no more. <laughs> See, and that's I'm what I'm saying. Get get it's a strange it. illness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Directing uh, anyone else? Thank you. Okay, Deborah Sayers. Good evening, everyone. Um, Good evening. So my name is Deborah Sears. I'm a parent here in the district. I was actually going to comment on the Vallejo Independent Bulletin's uh, running of our August seventh meeting. So I'm glad others are here to comment. Um, I usually use the format plus minus delta, what works well, what doesn't, what should change, so I'll follow that again. So what worked well? More community feedback, I think that's good. There's more discussions to clarify and share the information. I agree with Mr. Worrell, you don't know who they are, but I'll just take that with a grain of salt, I guess. At least it's feedback. There is realization that very few community members or parents attend or participate in our meetings regularly here. So, you know, my face is here a lot and mm. Berkey's <laughs> and a few others. I'm glad there's more out here today. It acknowledges how much the union influences education politics in California. There's some article links there. I thought that was very informative. And the other regular posters to VIB you read it and, and gave feedback on that. I thought that was good. It recommends strong support for our teachers on the front lines. I thought that worked very well. What doesn't work well? Thinking that good solutions are good enough. 
I want great, not just mm -hmm. good. So not good enough. No comments on the board agenda items still. We missed some important stuff last meeting. There were policies about bullying. Any feedback on that? No. About a lawsuit that had to deal with an incident at one of our schools that was violence. No comment on that. Open enrollment research, that whole thing, that's very important to parent choice, big deal in education. No comments about that. And no comments about the specific recommendations on the grand jury report. There were um, some posts about confidentiality and videos of student fights. I'd like to talk about that under the later community forum because I don't have enough time right now. And misunderstanding my comments about the grand jury report. I don't think it's invalid. I just don't think it's good enough without parents involved. And I'm defending our schools, not just <laughs> Ramona or others. I'm defending our schools and all the people who work so hard every day and are always told we suck. <laughs> I'm not going to stand by and let that happen anymore. <laughs> Sorry, you don't get the only opinion. What should change? Organize your feedback. Follow the items on the agenda and provide feedback to those topics. Or come to these meetings and speak directly. If you really care, come here and help us make change happen. Read the board policies, read Title I, tons of blogs out there um, that give good information about opinions. Our BEA president writes a very good blog, so I like reading her blog. Community accountability to our schools. Again, be safe, be responsible, be respectful. Thank you for listening. Thank you. That concludes our uh, community forum. I don't think I missed any cords. And I want to thank everyone for taking the time to uh, come and to speak. Um, at this point, report of board members. Director Waterman. Thank you. I would just like to compliment the staff and the teachers, the employees of the district, those of us at the district office, for making a really fantastic start of the year. I've been talking to my teacher friends, checking in at my schools, and it seems to me that it's a pretty well-oiled machine. And it's a really big, complicated machine. So kudos to you, and thank you for working so hard over the summer to prepare for that day and this year. That's it. Director Mumson. I have nothing. <laughs> Director Stewart. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to echo the words of Trustee Waterman. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, for the most part, it seems like it's been a very good start to the year. I know there's always things that need to be ironed out and some issues here and there. Um, we'll just hope that the timeline doesn't take too long for those things to occur, um, but I'm sure there are a few here and there. And, um, but for the most part, I'm you know, just really happy that there's a positive attitude, good coverage by uh, the media for the beginning of the school year, and just hoping that through the, the discussions that ended last year, the things that we discussed through the summer that we are in a better position for communication, for understanding each other's struggles, and uh, continue to grow this district. So thank you. Director Ubaldi. <coughs> thank you, Madam President. On August uh, 8th, I attended the uh, uh, summer graduation with, uh, with our president, um, Wilson. And on the 9th, I uh, helped uh, gave the Akashi Sister City delegation uh, a tour of uh, Jesse Bethel and also VCAT with, uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Mel Jordan also uh, being present. On the 12th of uh, August, I was president at the new teacher's orientation and on the 15th, I attended the open house at the Regional Career Center, the former adult ed, and they had an open house, and the turnout was quite good. I thought there was a lot of interest, and many of them gave, uh, told me that they were inter uh, came because of the, the brochure was so attractive that, uh, that it gave them uh, notice, and uh, they were excellent, a really excellent turnout. I don't know how the turnout uh, was Saturday morning, but uh, I attended the one on the, uh, on the 15th. Also, was, uh, I attended the VA uh, breakfast at the Vallejo High School and had a uh, positive rapport with the teachers, and many of them were surprised that uh, I was there representing us at that meeting. And, uh, so, but, but they were very thankful. 
Um, on the 17th, I also represented the board of the Vallejo Police Department Open House, and so many uh, folks from our school district present there also. Uh, on the 19th, what's the 19th? Oh, that's the first day of school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I attended three uh, elementary schools, um, uh, uh, Penny Cook, and then, uh, and then Trustee Mumpson also uh, attended with me, uh, Charter School, and also the uh, Grace, uh, Grace Patterson School uh, together and observed a lot of the activities. And finally, attended the, he and I attended the uh, Jesse uh, Bethel High School uh, school opening, and uh, and was very. I think everything everyone is saying it that that first day was very positive. I uh, people would even stop me in a walking at Jesse Bethel, and, and teacher would say, "Hey, it was a great turnout. It's been very positive experience." And uh, I don't know most of these teachers, but but they would. They would stop and, and greet me, and which I appreciate very much. Um, and I also had the privilege of attending the first class of the uh, Law Academy in the uh, class of Mr. Garrison. Is that is that is mm -hmm. that yeah. yes? And I was overwhelmed at the the syllabus that that the teacher gave the students. I said, "My goodness, I when I got that type of syllabus, I had it when I was a, a junior in college." And I said, I guess they're ju they're just that far advanced <laughs> nowadays. So I was I was thrilled to 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 be there and had the opportunity to to participate in the classroom through the invitation of the classroom teacher. And the last note I have here is the uh, I don't know if this is appropriate, Mr. Madam President, right, but yeah. just want to make note of the death of. Um, Mm -hmm. Mike Santos's father, mm -hmm. and the, the services will be held on the 9th, uh, the, the Sunday, excuse me, this coming Sunday night. Uh, there's something else there. Uh, at 9 o'clock at uh, St. Basil, and then at 1 o'clock, the uh, memorial service uh, at uh, the Veterans uh, uh, Hall at 1 o'clock. I think that is my report, Madam President. I'm just feel very um, positive that I had the opportunity to be many of those places that I was able to, to represent our board. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, I will be brief. I attended several days of training. I um, uh, tried to uh, get to the uh, site safety officers training, the administrative training, the teachers um, uh, two day training, uh, st any staff training. I try to be there because I like to know exactly what's, what is going on. So, and by being there rather than hearing uh, different perspectives, I definitely want to um, commend um, the uh, two-day training by Dr. Jeff Andrade. Outstanding, just outstanding. And the uh, feedback from the teachers were just, um, that I heard was just phenomenal, uh, something that we had not done before. Um, I did attend last Saturday, um, uh, uh, Coach Wilson and I went uh, to a service for uh, Vacaville High School's longtime assistant track coach, football coach, and teacher, uh, Steve Green. Um, we've known him forever. Um, very well loved, um, um, 56 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, we celebrated his life, and it was a tremendous experience. Um, on uh, Friday evening, I went with uh, nine young ladies, uh, teenagers, to see the butler. Um, and they got that historical experience as we moved toward the 50th year of the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, the joy of this week was uh, the first day of school. Just absolutely wonderful. I was, of course, at Glen Cove Elementary School, set in on fourth 
third and fourth grade um, uh, uh, first few minutes of the class. Very impressed, know it's going to be exciting. Then I moved on to Vallejo High School, where I not only visited with high school students and teachers, but I made my way to the Child Development Center because the young man who will be in the Vallejo High School class of 2028 was there. And he was so excited to see Grana. <laughs> and Grana was so excited to see him. But uh, all aside, uh, it's wonderful to see the Child Development Center that students get to remain in school because their children are there. And then the faculty can have their children there also. Um, the, uh, just the enthusiasm of the teachers um, at Glen Cove listening to the plans for the year. I have great joy. I, we have a uh, third and fourth grader. Just very excited. So um, I guess I'll be uh, having kids in school forever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a blessing. Um, that concludes my report. If there are no other comments by board members, um, we'll have the report of the superintendent. President Wilson, thank you. I'll be brief um, this evening. I just wanted to um, share again with the board, because many of you came by the Professional Development Leadership Institute. Um, but I want to say that ramping up for the beginning of school uh, begins right after school ends um, in the year before. And so I certainly want to commend all of the design teams. We trained over 200 parents, teachers, administrators right after school let out. And the focus was really ramping up on our PBIS understanding, uh, really beginning the conversation about critical pedagogy um, and thinking about restorative justice and how it is that we could really have our campus calming efforts kick in and begin the process of building our culture of excellence, which really, really begins this year. And as indicated in the newspaper, really, this is where everything comes together. This is the year where all of the things you set in motion with us two and a half years ago, everything lands this year. So what you have in front of you and for the community, there are extras on the back table is our um, Professional Development Leadership Institute catalog and brochure. Um, I have to commend Dr. Elena Shackelford, who took the lead on this, and Mr. Mike Cheap um, did the logistics for many of the days. But every staff member contributed to this high-level uh, professional development opportunity. So I certainly want to commend staff, all of the attendees, as well as all as the, of the planners, implementers, and presenters. Additionally, I want to commend our teachers because although school was out, many of them were either in Orlando, Florida, attending the National Academy Foundation training to prepare us for our wall-to-wall -wall academy efforts this year, or they were at LEAD training throughout this state and in other states getting prepared to implement with rigor our engineering curriculum, or they were just out there doing their thing. Many of our artists and so forth, many of them teach at Turo University and beyond. So I certainly want to commend our highly trained and skilled staff for all of the preparation efforts, because it's only because of those efforts that we can begin this year so strongly. Um, I also want to thank uh, the union for continuing to be available. We have a lot going on, and so I know that Gigi has been working with Crystal throughout the summer to gain an understanding of how we would move forward. Some of these things are negotiable, so we have to have the union sign off on these things, and we appreciate them for being available. But not leastly, I certainly want to thank the parents. Um, People may look at our board meetings and think that we don't have community participation, but uh, last night I was with over 100 parents at Jesse Bethel High School. And so whereas it may appear that the parents are not here, they are here. And they are present 
each and every evening there is something. You could literally eat for free throughout our community. <laughs> that's how I gained the 20 pounds the first year. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's a whole nother conversation. But at any rate, um, last night, over 100 parents, that's where I saw Miss Williams, right? Wilson. Wilson, last night. And she said, ooh, I gotta get down to that board meeting and thank you guys. So our parents are everywhere. And they're pushing us to be excellent every day. And we are going to live up to the high expectations that they have for us and for their students. So thank you, thank you, thank you um, for allowing me these moments to speak and commend our staff and our community. This is going to be an excellent year. Um, and I think it's gonna slow down a little bit, Mel, right? Thank you so much. Moving to item 7.1.1, 20, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry, local control funding formula. It's part of the superintendent's report. No problem. Uh, President, is that turned on? Uh, President Wilson, honorable trustees, Superintendent Bishop, James Arcala and I were asked to put together, uh, Dr. Bishop wanted you to have an overview of the local control funding formula, which is the new method of funding schools effective with the 2013-14 school year. So there's copies of our materials in the back of the room for anyone in the audience who would like to follow along, and I know the board has copies. So previously, um, schools were funded through a formula called the revenue limit. And that was put into effect about 36 years ago when I first started in school business. And it was an attempt to take the money per student and equalize it between districts with very high property tax base and low property tax base. And the revenue limit was our basic funding model. And then we added categorical programs for every type of unique need. So when we identified there needed to be counseling at the high school, we needed money for instructional materials, we kept adding on all these categorical programs. And so when you ask a school district how much money did you receive per student, often it was very difficult to identify that because the total that we received to educate students was our revenue limit, but then you had to add in all the categorical money, which only applied to certain students in certain instances, and then we had to try to keep track of all that. Then when uh, funding became short and there wasn't enough money in the budget to fully fund the revenue limit, we started receiving deficits on the revenue limit, and then they tried to give us more flexibility in categorical programs. So then, not only did we have to keep track of what is the revenue limit supposed to be, but what are we actually getting in money? And which categorical programs do we qualify for, but how much money were taken away from categorical programs to flex around to cover the shortfall in the revenue limit and good luck in trying to figure out how much money we received per student to fund our educational program. So for over 12 years, the state has been looking at wanting to do something and change the funding model, but it's very difficult to change a funding model during times of economic loss because everybody <coughs> wants to gain in the new funding model, but nobody wants to lose. And so they had to wait to implement the new model until the economy turned around, and luckily this is the first year. So under the new model, they're looking at it very similar to a weighted student formula that you might have heard about that they do in other states and other places, where they're funding the students based on the type of student and trying to equalize funding and yet address individual student needs. So, next slide. So the governor's policy goals in pursuing reforms to the school finance system was 
increasing transparency by reducing complexity, having it all rolled into one funding model that would be relatively easy to look at, to reduce the administrative burden of all those categorical programs, to increase flexibility and accountability at the local level, because one of the key parts of the new funding, which you'll be working on this year, is your local community accountability plan. And then to ensure that student needs drive the allocation of resources and to approve funding equity across districts. Another key goal by identifying students based on need is the hope that this method of funding will allow the resources to close the achievement gap mm -hmm. that we have between different populations and also to tighten the ties between the community and the school district as we look at how are we going to address our unique needs and where do we want to spend the money to close those achievement gaps and to target those funds. So um, the features of the LCFF is that it eliminates revenue limits and it eliminates 75% of categorical programs. So the bulk of all the categorical programs will now be folded into our base allocation and the only categorical programs that will be separate are things that we have uh, federal and state mandates for like special ed and and some of those programs. There's four pieces to the LCFF. The first piece is a base grant, and it used to be the revenue limit uh, of $6,500 or whatever the number was, was the same regardless of the level of student. But now the base grant will be different and recognizes the unique needs of high school students and middle school students versus elementary school students. And that's also because things like high school class reduction and others are folded in. Then in addition to the base grant, you're given supplemental money to provide services to low income and English learner students. And low income is your free and reduced price lunch students. Then there's a concentration grant which says if you have more than, that's the next page, yeah. If you have more than 55% of your students are low income and English learners, you get another bonus. So uh, this page, which goes into detail, shows you the targeted base rates for each of the four levels. So you can see between 6,800 for K3 and almost 8,300 for 912, they'll be looking at funding us based on the level of the students. Then there's two areas that are added to the base rate, and the first is uh, K3 class size reduction. And they're willing to give us 10% more for our K-3 students if we'll implement a class size reduction model. And then for high school students, they're also adding money in for career technical education, although that money does not have to be spent on that particular program. Uh, then each of the English language or low income students will get 20% of the adjusted base. So without getting too technical, um, a high school student would get a 20% increase on the 8,200. A elementary school student would get a 20% increase or the 68 or 6,900. So under the formula, even your increases for low income or English learners are scaled over those four grade levels. Then uh, the concentration funding, I already mentioned, and then they add on the money for home to school transportation and, and some of the others. So the um, illustration on how this would work, um, those little students there <laughs> <laughs> are to represent the first part um, are 
to represent the students that are over the 55%. And in Vallejo, our percentage is going to be somewhere around 78% based on our free and reduced price and our, our English learners. So if you look uh, for an elementary student, we would be, this was a sample prepared by the legislative analyst office, we would be in the middle line and the first line where we would have base funding of 68.45, we'd have an adjustment for class size reduction for implementing that, then we'd get our 20%, which is an extra $1,500 for every student that was low income or English learner, and then because we're 78% and we're above that 55%, we would get a concentration bonus um, that would be determined based on the 23% that were over the 55%. Have I lost you yet? No. Okay. <laughs> no. Next slide. So here's an example of three districts last year and three districts this year as far as the target. Remember this is a goal. This isn't actual funding yet, this is the goal. So last year, whether you were low, medium, or high on low income or English learner, you would get $6,500 per student and then they would add on all the categoricals. Under the new LCFF target level, if you have 1% eligible, you can see it would be approximately 8,000. 60% eligible would be 9,100, and 100% eligible would be 11,300. Our district is at 78%, so we're medium high. Um, and the exact amount will have to be determined based on, as I said, that extra percentage is, is it uh, do those low-income students, are they elementary, middle, or high? So it'll have to be computed based on where those kids actually are because it's a bonus per student. So what I alluded to is these are target numbers, but there's not enough funding to do this. But when they put together the LCFF, they said, we want to come up with a model that makes sense and addresses the needs of communities um, for having this formula based on the type of population they have. And we don't want to not do it just because we don't have the money to do it. <laughs> we want to come up with the target number. And then each year, as Proposition 98 and school funding uh, is addressed, it'll get us a little closer to the target. And the total cost to fully implement this would be an additional $18 billion over what it cost last year. Not where we were way back when, but just the difference between last year's funding under the old formula, deficited, and this year's funding, if it was no deficit, fully funded, would be $18 billion. They think they can do that over eight years. So the goal is to do it on an eight-year plan, and this year would be 12%. So we're on target to get 12% of the class size money, 12% of the increase for our uh, low-income students, 12% of all the changes in the funding formula. Then next year, they'll look at the budget, and if they can fund more, 13, 14 percent, we'd get there closer than eight years. If they can only afford and the economy <coughs> gets bad four or five years from now and they can only fund eight or nine percent, it'll be less. So we'll always have the funding of whatever the tier was that they gave us the year before, but there's no guarantee, so it'll be difficult to do two-year, three-year, four-year projections. They'll have to be based on a range of how close they'll be to be able to do their 12% a year. <laughs> but the good news is you're still looking at over 450 to $500 more per student mm -hmm. this year plus the new funding base. So James will uh, 
explain some of the things that we're implementing now. So let's talk about uh, K through three class size reduction. So uh, the overall goal is 24 student average must be reached at full implementation by 2020, 21. So that gives us about eight years to do that. So the district must meet intermediate annual targets, uh, which is a 12% progress of 2013 to 14. So we have to meet uh, up to 12% progress uh, of the entire goal. And we're gonna kind of break that down and calculate how we get to there. But to help with that goal, we're gonna get, like Sarah said, 12% to help with that. And that's gonna be a little bit over $375,000 for the year. However, and this is a big however, if any school does not meet their annual CSR goal or class size reduction goal, then the entire district loses the entire allocation for that year. So each school must meet their class size reduction goal. And so this year we're gonna make sure that we keep a very close eye on class size reduction for K through three. So let's give you guys a little bit of an example in this little box right here on how we calculate the CSR or class size reduction goal. So an example, you have a, a K through three class or, or K through three site or school uh, at average of 28. So the target, you know, by tw 2021 is 24, because we have to meet that 24. 12, the difference of 28 minus 24 is four. So then to meet 12% of that, you just times four, four times 12%, which equals to 0.48. And so you have 28 minus the 0.48, which gives you the CSR goal of 27.52. So that's gonna be our goal for this year for that specific site. Um, so that's how we meet the goal. We have to do that for each of the schools. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper into categorical programs in the LCFF and how that's gonna be impacted. So over the years, you know, we got categorical funding for all sorts of things. General purpose for instructional materials. We also got a lot of categorical programs for targeted needs. Uh, a good example would be gifted and talented e or economic impact aid. And so, like Sarah said earlier, the LCFF replaces most categorical programs. So let's see what that actually looks like. So at the top, which is very tiny, I apologize to the community, it's really small. At the top, that's the retained programs that we're gonna keep as is. That stays as is. All the stuff below that is what's being eliminated and folded into the base allocation. So overall, 75% of categorical programs will be cut and folded into the base allocation. What's gonna be retained, like Sarah said earlier in our earlier slides, are the programs that, and I'm gonna just kinda list it out, that are established by state initiatives, these are the ones that are gonna be retained, federal statutes, court orders, or settlements. Those are the programs that will be retained, and the rest, as you can see, will be uh, eliminated and folded into the base. And so, to conclude, we're gonna leave you guys with a, you know, a good analogy here. That's the governor right there giving a presentation on this dollar. Uh, he's really, his main message is that the local control funding formula would create a just allocation for students and it would be divided in this way. If you just got a dollar, uh, that dollar 80% would uh, represent, 80 cents would represent um, the base and then 16, 16 cents would represent the supplemental grant which uh, helps out our low income students and uh, our EL students. And then finally, the concentration grant refers to the, the students that go 55% over the LI students and the EL students. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I hope that um, gives you an overview of the funding formula, and we'd be happy to answer any questions on the formula and how it affects Vallejo. Thank you, um, Director Waterman. Um, thank you, Ms. Hart. Nice to meet you. Um, okay, that was exciting. We got really excited there. I almost started to cry. Um, <laughs> now I'm back to earth. Thank you for taking me back down. Reality. Yeah, I know. Um, nevertheless, when do we get that money? Do we have our rate? <laughs> <laughs> Let's cut to the chase. You're going to promise me money, but I want to see it. Where is the, it? The nice thing about this is uh, we will get the money this year. Our first apportionment, our advanced apportionment, 
and our first apportionment will be based on last year's funding. And um, then by the end of the year, um, they hope to have all the kinks ironed out of the formulas so that uh, we will actually receive the money this year. It's not something we have to wait for. The thing that makes mm. it difficult is the county's already done a first cut of the numbers of what it would mean for Vallejo, but there's so many <coughs> um, small nice. points that are unknown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it doesn't affect the major part, but before they can actually come out with the forms and the schedules, they have to address the unique things for charter schools, independent study, all the things that don't fall under the normal formulas. And the state has until basically January 1st to do that. So they're gonna go ahead and fund us based on the old model. Um, they're gonna, they haven't, the State Board of Education has until January to come up with a lot of the different regulations on things and then we'll just be going to constant workshops on the implementation this year. But we will receive the money this year and for class size reduction, that's one of the reasons we address that tonight, is that has to be implemented from the Star School in order to get the money <coughs> this year. Okay. Um, class size reduction is probably the dream. I mean, I it's we fought and fought and fought and fought and fought to keep it, and it's so exciting to know that we're going to start getting it back. Here's my here's the red flag that just went up. We're not being given the money to do what we're mandated to do right now, and we're trusting the state of California to come through. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean, I am with you. I'm I'm all in. But here we are with the state of California making promises again. Reminds me of whatever amount, dollar amount they owe us with a, all of our IOUs that they've been writing since Arnold Schwarzenegger was in office. Help us. Um, so, it, you know, we we're getting some money, but it's not the money that we need to right. do what we're doing right now. And we're, we're right. banking on um, the state of California, not the most reliable we're Entity, right? Go for it. Uh, no, I I understand <laughs> since they've often given it to us at the beginning of the year and then frozen it in the middle of the year. Um, class size reduction, since we're only required to go 12 percent towards the goal, not the full implementation to 24, but just 12 percent. It's based on each individual school. Mm. A lot of our schools are already at 24 to 1 or below that. Mm. Some mm -hmm. of the schools are very close, and then some of the schools that have been, say, at 28 or 29 are only required to go to 27 or 28. So as of right now, we're looking at adding five teachers, at the most seven. And so um, I think we can comfortably cover this first 12% this year to be in compliance. Good. And Thank then you. see how, how it rolls out. The mm -hmm. other thing that's nice is we're, we'll already get paid for the schools that already are 24 below. So we'll get the full amount of money even though we only have to implement it at the schools that are above that. And I think it's more reasonable than the old mm -hmm. 20 to 1 program. Uh, 24 is much more doable. Mm -hmm. But the, f the other side of that is, is they are very strict that no school cannot achieve their target number, but it's an individual target number for each school, so we'll have to monitor that closely. Thank you. Um, I guess oh. my only other question is in regards to the, wow. The eliminated programs underneath there that says the charter school block grant. Can you help me understand what will happen to the three charter schools that we have in the district with that eliminated? Uh, the charter schools will be funded under the new formula. Mm -hmm. So they Thank also you. will benefit from this mm -hmm. based on their population and their base uh, revenue. I don't want to say revenue limit, but their base funding amount will be higher. And then they'll also qualify for the additional for their low-income students. Thank you. Director Stewart. Thank you. And thank you for the report. 
I, I take away from your presentation that we stand to benefit, but there's going to be some higher scrutiny or timely accountability at the local level for uh, making sure we get this new program done right the first time, meaning there's penalties for being over a little bit or missing a mark even though it's, it's new to us. Um, to what degree is the state holding you know, really hard and fast on that? Are we in a position where from the superintendent to the assistant principal at whatever school site, everyone's got to hit their mark the first time or a whole program or funding goes away because of one snafu in re record keeping or whatever the case may be. The reason <laughs> I bring it up is because we've no. been through the audit process right. we, and we know how you know there can be findings and then you try to get something adjusted right. based upon more evidence or more information. Right. And, and, and again, also that this is new. And so we're asking folks that are used to a certain process to implement a new one, but also do it right the first time. Okay. Where we are held accountable, um, are in basically uh, there's three areas that we should target. Maybe I overemphasize the class size reduction penalty because that would only apply to the 375,000 for class size, 376. That wouldn't apply to our other funding. So one area of accountability is being sure at K3 that we hit our target numbers for class size reduction and that's a $375,000 to $400,000 uh, bonus that we want to be sure we qualify for that bonus. Not meeting that target would not jeopardize our base funding. What our base funding is going to be based on and what we would want to focus our accuracy on is our uh, CalPADS data. Our identification of free and reduced price being sure that all of those students are identified uh, because in future years it's going to be a three-year average. Uh, being sure all of our English learners are identified and being sure that when we take our uh, October count that all of that is accurate and that every single student that we're eligible for the bonus money on, we receive the bonus money because the base funding is going to be based on our ADA, but then that bonus funding is based on us being sure. Um, and I've talked with the child nutrition uh, people, and they seem to be really on top of that. And, uh, and we've also talked with uh, Mike Cheap, who's really good and with the new Aries and keeping track of everything. We want to be sure that every student that we get bonus funding for uh, we do get bonus funding for. Okay. I can't remember what the third one was. Oh, the, the categorical. Is there are some requirements uh, in the folding of categorical um, that we'll have to be looking at as far as transportation and adult ed and, and some of those programs. Mostly your accountability now for categorical instead of reporting on each of the categorical, what the shift is going to be towards is our uh, local control accountability report that the board and the superintendent and the instructional division staff <coughs> will be working with the community throughout this year. You have a year to do that. It has to be fully approved by the end of the year. And that's saying, how are you going to take this new money and be sure that it targets the low income and English learners and the students that need it the most? So the focus is going to be on accountability and identification of students. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. W one other thing, um, and this goes back to the comment by Trustee Waterman and this is my cynical question of the evening related to the state. Um, the example you provided us um, had to do with the existing rate we receive that's, you know, getting a, a certain percentage deferred each time we receive it. Right. Based and then uh, comparing it to a non uh, percentage taken away, a cut taken away by the state. This 
new formula doesn't change anything about how um, the legislature is able to implement things. Um, for example, the Prop 98 um, deferred payments or anything else that has been in place here and there that um, various advocacy groups have fought to say, no, this is not constitutional or whatnot. This doesn't change any of that, correct? There's no, it doesn't address some of those tools that the state has used to not give us the full amount. Right, we'll still be subject to the Prop 98 uh, as far as the amount of funding. And the question becomes is, th this is a target number, so as the new funds are available, they're going to be funding the shortfalls between what we've got last year and where they hope to take us. But the nice thing is it, they won't be competing over adding or deleting this categorical program. It's going to be focused mm -hmm. now. Um, so a lot of the advocacy on those individual sure. programs is put by the wayside mm -hmm. because now it's how much money goes into your targeted funding goal. So Which you should make the process quicker. Yeah, should. Yes. <laughs> but that leads to the you know, the budget being on time, you know, the right. you know, so Well the nice thing about um, Vallejo is they built their budget here on the revenue limit formula. Mm -hmm. So we're very conservative in our budget so we did not plan on any of this new money in this year's budget so when we bring the first interim report and we update the information and the second interim report um, we'll have a much more firmer knowledge of how much we qualify for and what the numbers are but um, the superintendent has been very clear that she wants any new money that comes in to be part of the planning for future years and it's my understanding that all the program improvements you have in place for this year you already have the funding in place to cover those so this in each any Variable. action on half of this on the part of the state to not fully fund this the way they're telling us they're going to would affect your programs for next year not this year because none of this has been included in your budget Thank you. My question um, concerns systems of checks and balances. And uh, what are we putting in place to ensure that, um, and to ensure that there are no hiccups? And uh, that would mean a normal system of checks and balances, uh, accountability, Who's going to, um, how are we going to use different staff to monitor who's the first responsibility, second, third, and at some point, you don't have to answer this now, at some point I want to see this, um, a system of checks and balances, the flow chart, the normal accounting uh, flow chart to show me where we start and where we're going to finish, okay, uh, so that, um, uh, we don't find ourselves, and also, so I know who I'm going to hold accountable, okay, uh, besides myself. Uh, so um, that is something that I ex expect for us to see in the future. I don't expect a response now. And uh, certainly this topic will be coming back several yes. times. Um, in our fall meeting, the Solano County School Boards Association, I'm the president there also, we do plan on having uh, this topic as our topic, topic for the dinner meeting. So, and then we plan on doing it in uh, October. So, okay. Director Ubaldi. Uh, thank you for your report, Ms. Hart. Uh, earlier, uh, Ms. Patrick reported about the numbers of new hires and in the elementary level, she's talking about 13 full-time uh, equivalency. Now, is your report impacting that at all in regards to the class size? You spoke about needing four or five more teachers. Right. We or is that already part of that 13? That's part of the 13. Okay. It includes five full-time equivalents due to class size reduction. 
and okay. some and the balance were teachers that were needed because of normal enrollment. Okay, okay so that's that's not part on Correct. top of that thirteen then. No. Okay. It's Thank included you. in that. Appreciate it. Okay. I believe this concludes uh, that particular item. It was an information item. We appreciate the report. Uh, I am very pleased uh, uh, with uh, uh, the financial report that our uh, financial uh, officers have given. I have a lot of confidence in it. Thank you. Um, item 7.1.1-2910, audit report, Cleo Cheney. Good evening, President Wilson, Governing Board, and Superintendent. Tonight, I would like to present the State Controller's Office, our auditors that performed the 2009-10 audit report for them to make their official presentation to the Governing Board. Um, Joel? Welcome. Good evening, Dr. Wilson, uh, Superintendent, Dr. Bishop, and fellow board members. My name is Joel James, and I'm uh, the audit manager from the State Controller's Office. And I have uh, with me uh, Carolyn Baez, who is the Bureau Chief over the Financial Audits Division. And I'm here to present the uh, audit report for the Vallejo uh, School District uh, for the year that ended June 30th, 2010. How will it work? Um, do I click a button or somebody? <laughs> They're hoarding the okay. clicker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> and so what I'll be doing um, tonight is pretty much going over the audit report and identifying the components of what make up the audit report. And then toward the end, I'll give a summary of uh, the audit report in terms of what it actually um, results in. And then um, if there are any questions uh, that you guys have, um, you can ask at that time. So uh, with the audit report, um, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of pages, and it may seem overbearing at times, but I mean, if you dissect it, um, you'll find out that it's only made up of five sections. Uh, it contains the financial section, the required supplementary information section, the supplementary information section, the other independent auditor's reports, and the findings and recommendations. With the financial section, it includes the independent auditor's report. And that report is where we give our opinion about the district's financial statement. So for the year that was under audit, um, our opinion uh, was considered qualified, uh, where we indicated that uh, the district's uh, financial statements were for the most part uh, reliable. Uh, the only issue that we pointed out which caused the qualification was in the area of associated student body funds uh, where we were not able to audit uh, that fund based on the lack of information and detail that was uh, provided or not provided by the district. Um, and then I also mentioned that at the beginning of the report is the index so uh, y you, you would be able to get to what page number these areas are located. Um, the second area of that financial section includes the management discussion and analysis section. And that's where the district um, highlight the and summarize the actual uh, financial results of the districts. Um, comparisons are made between the uh, current financials um, as well as the prior year financials. And there are also other information uh, that the district provides uh, um, based on uh, circumstances uh, that the district was involved with during that time. Uh, this area also includes the basic financial statements. 
Now the basic financial statements are going to be split up into two areas where uh, the first statements will be the government-wide financial statements where all of the dis district funds are consolidated into a single balance sheet and a single financial statement or income statement. Um, and then there are the fund financial statements uh, for the major funds and that's where the balance sheet and the income statement is uh, uh, split up where you can see individually by fund what the outcomes are in terms of uh, the uh, financial categories. And then there are the notes to the financial statements which add detail and information uh, to the uh, financial statements that are being presented. Um, the next section of the audit report is the required supplementary information section. And this area of the report includes a schedule of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. And that basically is a, a report where uh, the district's revenues um, and expenditures are compared to their budgets. And you can see what the differences are between what was budgeted and what actually occurred during the year. Um, it also includes a schedule of other post-employment benefits, um, otherwise known as OPEP. Um, and this is something that uh, not just districts, but pretty much all entities um, are required to start in including and disclosing in their financial statements regarding the uh, liability that's associated with uh, employees uh, that have retired. Um, and then the last area for this section include notes, which are uh, detail involving uh, the two schedules that are listed there. And the third uh, part of the uh, audit report includes the supplementary information. And this includes uh, various schedules and information uh, that uh, identify uh, the non-major funds, uh, financial statement information, the district's uh, organization chart, as well as uh, the schedule of average daily attendance, uh, instructional time, uh, class size reduction, um, and the uh, financial trends and analysis. Um, in addition to, uh, there's a schedule of charter schools, uh, excess sick leave, uh, the schedule of expenditures of federal awards and a reconciliation between the annual financial and budget report with the audited financial statements um, along with notes uh, uh, for that section. And then the fourth uh, area of the audit report uh, is the other independent auditor report section where uh, there are three other areas where we give our opinion about. Um, as I said originally, up at the front of the report, we're giving an opinion about the district's financial statements. Well, in this area, we uh, provide a report on our opinion in the other areas, uh, such as internal controls, which is the first bullet, and then the middle bu bullet, uh, we give our opinion on the uh, district's uh, compliance with federal requirements. And then we also give uh, our opinion on the district's compliance with state compliance um, requirements. And in all three of these areas, we also, also issue qualified opinions. Um, and just to uh, summarize what you know, the opinions mean, um, in terms of an audit, uh, an unqualified opinion is a perfect audit. Um, a qualified opinion is when it's an okay, but there's an except for uh -huh, that's involved. Um, and then there's a disclaimer of opinion where you know there's either scope limitations or issue that you know issues that we were not able that causes not to be be able to perform the audit in certain areas. And then there's the adverse uh, where if we note that the district isn't following generally accepted accounting principles and you know areas of requirements, that would lead to an adverse opinion. And so, you know, I'll also point out that uh, with this audit report, um, it, we've issued a qualified opinion, and uh, I think since 2005, uh, when I first started doing these audits, uh, this is the first time that the district has uh, obtained a qualified opinion, whereas all prior audits, uh, they've always, they've been disclaimed. 
uh, for various reasons. So uh, with this audit, there was um, time spent in terms of the district allowed to provide information uh, to support what they were giving us in terms of financials um, that would allow us to do the audit work and verify what they're giving us. Um, and you know, that resulted in us being able to, uh, for the most part, uh, give the district a, a report with you know, minor uh, qualifications. Okay. Um, and then the last area of the uh, audit report is the findings and recommendations section. And what this area include, uh, there's a schedule of findings and question costs. Uh, that schedule pretty much summarizes uh, the overall audit um, and the types of opinions that were given. Um, and then there's also the index to the findings and recommendations where you'll see all the findings that were identified during the audit. Uh, there's an index uh, to list out each finding um, and the, the finding numbers that they're referenced by. Um, and then we also include the uh, actual findings uh, along with our recommendations. Um, um, and then there's a schedule of prior audit findings at the very end of the report. And that schedule pretty much identifies findings that were um, identified in last year's audit. Um, and it, it details what the uh, status is based on the results of this audit. Um, and so that's pretty much the report. Um, like I said uh, previously, overall, uh, the district had a qualified opinion. Um, that qualification resulted uh, from the financial statements of us not being able to audit the uh, uh, student body program. Um, we also uh, identified uh, going concern issues. Um, going concern issues uh, during that uh, time frame involved uh, the district's uh, declining enrollment. Um, there were ongoing uh, findings uh, that had related question costs associated with them, um, as well as state budget cuts uh, that impact the district's uh, source of revenue. Um, and then there are also negative certifications that the district uh, file with the, um, the county and the state uh, during the, the following year, which was 2010-11. Um, in terms of the uh, findings and recommendations, we identified 16 findings um, that were related to the financial statements. And there were a total of seven findings that were related to the federal compliance areas. And with the federal compliance findings, uh, the question costs associated with those findings uh, was $1.2 million in question costs. Um, and the uh, state compliance findings, uh, there were a total of 12 uh, that resulted in a question cost of $1.3 million. And you know, I want to point out that with the, f the uh, federal and the state findings, um, with the total question cost of uh, basically $2.5 million, those actually resulted from uh, primarily two findings. Um, for the most part, there was a million dollar finding in the federal section that dealt with ARA funds. And then there was a million dollar finding in the state compliance section that dealt with the uh, ratio of uh, administrative employees to teachers. Um, so those were the two findings that pretty much made up the bulk of the question costs that came out of this audit. And so those are areas that the district has been made aware of and you know, they're you know, working uh, on those uh, areas. So you know, the goal would be to uh, remedy the issues uh, uh, to resolve findings uh, so that they don't reoccur. Um, and with that, uh, that's the 2009-10 audit report. Um, are there any questions that uh, uh, the board may have? Okay. We are pleased to have a qualified opinion moving from a disclaimer 
because that's saying that our books and records are improving to the point where they can be audited. Um, of course, we'd like unqualified, but we'll get we'll move toward there also. Um, we're this is the nine ten, is that right? Yes. So we still this is this is nine ten. Yes. Uh, so then we have ten eleven, eleven twelve. Uh, I'm 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 just hoping that it, uh, we get current, um, because audits are much easier done if you are current. Um, so I'm hoping that our audits get to be current, because the books and records are then available. Uh, it's just a much more easier process. So we are we have moved forward toward getting current, but. Um, uh, the sooner that we can get current, uh, the more easier our audits will be in terms of the process. And also, um, you save money. You could say potentially save money because the records are readily available, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's what I'm hoping is that we get uh, current as quickly as possible because we have, have quite a few years still outstanding. Um, you're always, you know, going to have some delay, but this is. Uh, we need to get current. Director Mumpson. Um, I just wanted to say that this is exciting. This is great that we've finally, this is the first time since I've been here that we've got a qualified but, um, report. And I look forward to more uh, current ones where you don't have to blow the dust off the records to <laughs> dig down and find it. But it's exciting that we're getting better at it too. So thank you for your report. You're welcome. This is an information item. Um, oh, Madam President, I have uh, one question. And yes. That is, uh, uh, Mr. James, you alluded to um, to uh, remedy, and uh, now, how long do we have? What kind of time do we have to remedy our the concerns that that was raised by the audit? Is there a timetable for that? Well, with each audit, we revisit the issues uh, that were pointed out in the prior audit. Mm -hmm. um, and I know in some cases, because where we are now, two years out, that you know, some of those issues that are in that report okay. have been remedied. Ah, okay. um, and so it's with each audit, uh, the expectation okay. is that the audit report uh, reflect um, a change status okay. of being remedied. All right. Thank you. This is an information item, as I said. We'll move on to 7.2.1, Interim Chief Business Officer Services. Thank you. Oh, did we have a card? Okay, so I'm sorry, I missed the card. Dr. Robert Sussel. Okay, for clarification, your card, Dr. Shussel, was on 7.3.1. It was 7.3.1, so you want 7.1. Very good. Okay. I'll just make it brief. I have, first of all, a question for Mr. James. I know it's not the school district's fault, but how useful is it to look at data that's almost three years old? To me, that seems a frustration that you know, you're asking people to react to stuff that's old and, and as if it, it's today's stuff. And I think that needs to be maybe emphasized. Uh, also, uh, let me just say, the one thing I saw in the report that I think troubled me, and maybe someone could talk about it, it was finding 10.01. It said, based on a review of the district's current fiscal conditions, we have concluded that there's substantial doubt about the district's ability to continue about an ongoing concern. And then it's got some things below it. And I realize that the state administrator helped things some, but has he helped them enough that you're still not really worried about that as a, a potential consequence? And because this thing is 180 pages, I just really wonder whether the board members are able, most of them are able to fully understand a document like this, and do you need some kind of special session? I know it wouldn't be a very exciting one, but to go over some of these things to better understand what some of the major issues are in that report, because I, I read, I skimmed it, 
and I, I think that it would be very hard for in a short meeting like this to really address what those concerns are. Thank you. Um, the report um, I have set in on many of uh, the meetings, number one, I understand the report because my degree is in accounting, obviously, I, 38 years with Internal Revenue Service. Each of our board members have different skills and different levels of understanding. As far as the size of the report is a normal uh, size for a report. Um, and um, the findings, um, I think that it, the reason we have a qualified report, um, um, finding rather than a disclaimer or um, a negative report is that there has been substantial improvement. Um, a study session, we certainly could have a study session as long as the other board, if, if it was requested by, by the board members. This is an information item at this time. And um, what other question did you have? You were asking whether we understood it. I, I can say I do understand the report. What I meant in the sense of did, does everyone understand it well <laughs> enough that they're really comfortable, or do you really need a study session to understand those areas that may need more work? And y one of your comments was about it being three years old. Yes. Uh, that's what I addressed at the beginning was the fact that we have to become, we have to, we're trying to get current. But you can't skip to become current. We have to go through the process. And um, many times audits are, um, uh, I, I don't know whether you guys do dual uh, concurrent audits. Um, and that's one of the ways to become current. But um, uh, we still are responsible to produce the records, even though it's a, uh, um, what was this, 910? 910. We know we have. Uh, uh, 10, 11, and 11, 12 uh, out there. Director Waterman. Thank you. Um, I, I, I recognize the frustration in that, and honestly, these audits ought to be more instructive and tools that we can use in real time, and currently we're racing to try and get there mm -hmm. so that we can. We're not averse to study sessions. We could have study... We could bore you for the rest of your life with the study sessions that we go to and, and have. But I think that once, and I agree with you, I think it's a fine idea because it would be publicized. People could come, people could see it online, and then they'd be able to understand the process. I do think that it might be more productive if it were more current. You know what I mean? And then we could all be talking about what we're doing right now, not just a tutorial and how to read audits. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And of course, we recognize that we're not going to ever, we will always, there was a, a lag of at least one cycle, okay, because you're not going to be uh, in, an, in the current year. We're not going to be looking at, at 13, 14 audit. We have to um, close the books and everything for um, the 12, 13. So you're always going to have some lag time. And I just wanted to uh, also emphasize the fact that we do, uh, as we conduct our audits, the mm -hmm. audits are ongoing. Um, and so while we're performing the audits, we do meet with the district regularly as soon as we find out about an issue mm -hmm. so that they can start being proactive at the earliest time frame possible to uh, resolve some of the issues. And I have sit in on many of those meetings and continue to sit in. Also, I sit in on the internal audit uh, meeting. We don't just uh, uh, take it, stick it in the bottom drawer, and not look at it. Um, we do analyze it, put in a card, Berkey. Yeah, I will. Can I say something I'll put the card in? Okay, go on and talk, and but put your card in. President Wilson, and members yes. of the board, I just wanted to say, you know, this isn't the first board meeting. You've all been at, and a lot of us have been at, we've been coming here for 20 years. This isn't the first audit. This isn't anything brand new to this board that you have to all understand this one particular one. The states that are doing the audits years prior to the takeover, so this, like I say, this isn't the first one. Those that are coming here for the first couple of meetings, they may not understand that, but those of us that have been coming know 
You've seen a lot of these audit reports, so I know you understand them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to I want to uh, give my appreciation to the um, uh, State Controller's Office and uh, for uh, the audit um, in the meetings that I have set in on, uh, and of course, if I, I, I guess if people don't. You know, the layperson probably doesn't understand the audit process is an ongoing thing with continuous meetings. And um, as you said, uh, Joel, well, you discuss the issues as they go along. So it's not, this is the first time we've seen it when, when we receive the audit report. So, but I appreciate uh, the time and the effort. I appreciate, um, I think we've built a relationship. Um, we're, um, uh, we're open and honest and transparent with each other. Uh, we're not in any way defensive about our uh, findings. And we know that um, as they are brought to our attention or as they come into a finding, then the district begins to work on it at that time so that hopefully it will not be a repeat finding for the next year. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Seven point two point one, um, interim chief business officer services. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll take this one um, again. Um, I did a little bit of calculation here, and it's been over just about over thirty working days. Um, at its uh, special board meeting, we um, on July first, you know, the governing board, as it states in this report, appointed the former chief. Uh, uh, Business Officer Lisa Grant Dawson um, as the interim Chief Business Officer to provide a, again I'll just say this maybe three times, a smooth, a smooth, a smooth transition um, following her resignation. Mm -hmm. I had some other editorials to put on it, but I'm going to just keep it short on this Thank one. Thank you. Um, <laughs> again, as it says in the report here, uh, to aid in the transition and to maintain a fiscal accountability the governing board also approved two consultant service agreements, one being uh, Ms. Sarah Hart and TRR School Business Consultant Services during the July 19th board. Um, during the uh, recent transition period, the, uh, the Business Service Division, uh, you know, Sarah Hart has effectively, as has been demonstrated this evening as well, engaged uh, her expertise in providing the business services the appropriate continuity bridge, okay? Um, her expertise and her professionalism as a states and report in conjunction with uh, TRR business services um, will continue to provide the superintendent uh, with this high level of confidence um, that the district will maintain fiscal accountability and will meet its objective, again, its objective to fill the vacant position um, within a reasonable time period. Again, um, at this time, um, you know, uh, the, uh, on August 30th, uh, the interim chief business officer uh, contract with Lisa Grant Dawson um, will end. And, um, and with the successful transition that uh, we've been uh, hearing along with uh, the internal team with uh, James here, um, it's a natural progression uh, to appoint Ms. Uh, Sarah Hart as the new interim chief business officer until the permanent replacement is, uh, is uh, secured. So at that time, the recommendation here is that the governing board approve Sarah Hart as the interim chief business officer. Are there any questions? Director Stewart. Thank you. Uh, my only comment uh, had to do with the way the presentation came off this evening earlier on the agenda clear concise able to follow a mm -hmm. fairly difficult subject and so I, I just wanted to thank you for that because <laughs> we're used to getting things explained well to us <laughs> and I just with that said I wanted to make sure we have a picture of Lisa somewhere in this building on the wall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just as a reminder because sometimes it can get a little complicated with uh, the way these formulas work. But mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank you for coming back, so to speak, and, and also um, the way you went about uh, 
providing the information this evening you know, on a very difficult subject. Is that your motion? A motion? If there are no other comments. Any other comments? With that, I would approve. I would move to approve. Uh, Sarah Hart is the interim chief business officer. I would second. Second. It, it has been moved and seconded that we um, approve Sarah Hart as our interim chief business officer. Congratulations, Ms. Hart. Oh, oh okay. wait. All vote. those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hart. You are now our um, interim. <laughs> oh, we don't know about that. <laughs> we may forget um, to look for a permanent person. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, we have um, item 7.3.1, class size overage penalty waiver. Good evening again. Good evening. It is recommended that the governing board approve the recommendation to submit a class size penalty waiver request for grades one through three to the De California Department of Education for the 2012-2013 school year. Are there any questions? Director Stewart. Thank you. This is a good uh, setup for the question from the earlier presentation. How would this work under the new formula? Would this, would this type of waiver be in place or does that go away with the new rules? So our hope is that um, the reason that we're, we're in, we were in this situation for the 2012-2013 school year is because in the district's efforts to be as fiscally solvent as possible and to be very conservative with how we hired and staffed um, our schools, we were trying to not go over budget but also make sure that we met the needs of our students. And so this, hopefully we would not have a need for this. With our new staffing, with increasing classes and reducing um, our class sizes at the lower grade levels, we probably will not need to have to do this in the future. At least that's what we're planning for. Well, I would hope that's our goal. Um, I'm a little bit um, curious about the process though. And whether or not something like this would be in place moving forward mm -hmm. um, well what we what we have in place this year is so far we've been meeting together with mm -hmm. um, Gigi and the representatives of human resources with um, the representatives from instruction with Mike uh, with the superintendent um, and all the people involved to look at and monitor our warm body count and class size day by day at this point. And one of the things that we're doing is being proactive at not letting the classes get to 32 and then temporarily putting students in there until we can move them out. So if you can't go over 32, but you go ahead and enroll a student on a temporary basis until you can find a place for them and then move them out, your average for the year is going to be over 32 mm -hmm. because you're going to have 33 mm -hmm. right. in there. And that's what triggered this penalty was two classes at 33. So uh, the important thing is that we don't temporarily enroll those students, that we deal with the student when they come mm -hmm. to register by overflowing them at that time instead of letting it become. If we did not have those two classes at 33 and we had of only enrolled students up to 32, we wouldn't have this problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think just real careful monitoring and mm -hmm. I think the principals have, have been very supportive. And just to piggyback, if I could just remind everyone, um, prior to last year, we were losing 400 students per year 
from the beginning of the year to the second interim. And last year, we cut that in half by losing 200 students, but we had prepared for the 400. And so we were surprised in that we continued to, A, have kids remain enrolled, but also throughout the year we had um, students enrolling. Mm -hmm. And so it was a nice surprise to have. We were caught off guard. And this year, um, with the enhanced accountability around LCFF, mm -hmm we can't afford to do it again. Okay, and um, just one more thing to add to that, because attendance enrollment is it's now structured or in business, so we are going to make sure that we are going to meet constantly weekly to keep our close eye on CSR, the class size reduction, and the cap, which led to this penalty. So it is going to be constantly watched throughout the entire year, and not just the beginning of the year quarterly, but on a weekly basis, just to make sure that we are um, we are keeping up to these goals. As you guys know and you guys heard throughout the, the presentation, there is a huge penalty on our head if even one of the schools go over. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a action item. Oh, there was a card. I don't. No. Something for numbers. numbers. You have two on 8.2. 8 you have two on 8.2. Okay, I'm going to change that for you, Doctor <laughs> Susco. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, Director Mumpson, while he's coming to the microphone. Uh, I have a, a question. You know, it, it would it be possible for us to set our standard? Say it's uh, uh, class size is 30. Could we set our so we don't get cut off guard? Set it to 29. Uh, I think. Think about the fact that if we set it at 29 and additional teachers are needed, that uh, that's, uh, that impacts the budget. Does it not? I don't think it would. You're correct, President Wilson. What, what's happening is a, a school by school calculation mm -hmm. based on where we need to get in eight years. And so it's school by school, it's classroom, it, it's school by school, and it's an average that we're shooting for. And so um, it's a little different than it's been in the past where everybody's shooting for 20. We're having to prove incrementally that we're going toward that goal. And it's my expectation that they do just what they say they do, mm -hmm. monitor. Mm -hmm. That's their responsibility. And it's my expectation that it happens. Dr. Russell. Yeah, I, I, maybe it's a little bit more of a naive question, but you're talking about almost a $400,000 penalty. And what, you know, how sure are you that you're not going to get dinged and whether you'd be better off maybe hiring another teacher or something to, to take some of those extra kids so that you're not in this situation where you could lose That's a tremendous a amount of money. And I ask it more just as a risk reward thing. You know, how, how much are you, do you think you're gambling? I don't, I'm asking it not as a rhetorical question, but as a, mm -hmm. from your perspective, what do you really think? I think the answer is it's school by school versus uh, overall. Uh, so you would have to have an extra teacher perhaps at every school. Could, could so it's the schools meeting the average. Is that not correct? Okay. I guess what my, and I know I wouldn't be very popular with this answer, but uh -huh. if you bust a few kids from one school to another, would that solve your problem? I think the parents. I, I realize I have to wear Kevlar, you know. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't, th we appreciate your um, uh, comments, uh, and we certainly will take them under consideration, but uh, I think our most responsible action here is to do what we need to do, and that's to monitor. So we don't have any surprises, and don't drop the rock. Um, let me see. Crystal Watts. <coughs> Sorry, Crystal. First name basis, that's OK, <laughs> President Wilson. <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> Um, a couple of things. 
first of all, I'm going to say that this was probably the one thing that came up over and over and over again last year with teachers dealing with overages. Um, Monday, I, I'm working one day a week at Wardlaw, and I helped a kindergarten teacher on Monday, and I believe she had, she had 30, because uh, three of her kids didn't show up. And I'm going to tell you that 30 kindergartners in a classroom is quite a bit of work. And when you have 40 and 42, which some of our uh, kindergarten teachers started off with last year, it didn't stay that way. But some of them, some of our uh, teachers did have 33, 34 kids in their classrooms. And that is almost impossible to try to effectively teach our kids when we're trying to build um, ongoing one-on-one -on -one relationships. So... Um, with that being said, contractually, K through um, five, our teachers are limited at 32. And so what happens contractually is that teachers are paid $15 per day at the elementary level for each additional student. And then at the secondary level, it's $3 per student per period. So that's another financial consideration. And I don't have the numbers off the top of my head of how many of um, our teachers were over. But that's another thing besides that penalty to also keep in mind. And so. I'm just going to say, going into the school year, knowing and having the conversations with HR that they were really trying to make sure that they were staffing um, at a lower ratio, is hopefully going to make my life just a little bit easier this year. So I do appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Watts. And, and may I just um, piggyback and just say that last year, we did not ignore class size overages. and. There were teachers hired, there were, transportation was taken care of. It just was a year of managing kids that we didn't expect. And so the kids that we didn't expect bubbled to the top in two of these classes, which caused this penalty. But you're right, uh, 30 kindergarten is a lot. 20, 20 <laughs> kindergartners <laughs> for me would be a lot. Thank This is an... Are there any more questions? This is an action item. Madam President, if there's no further question, I would like to move that we adopt this item before us, 7.31. I second that. It is removed and seconded that we um, uh, adopt the class size overage penalty waiver. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The um, waiver has been adopted. Thank you. Um, we have 8.1, which is um, personnel action number 1454. Any, is it an information item? Any comments, questions? None. Thank you, Ms. Patrick. Thank you. 2013-14 uh, enrollment update information, Mr. Cheap. Good evening, President Wilson, board, and superintendent, Dr. Bishop. I'm here at the request of Trustee Mumson to come back and uh, talk about enrollment. So what you have in front of you is the enrollment we had, as you can see, from the 16th, which is last Friday, the day before school started. Um, I separated out in between the numbers at the top, include all regular ed kids and special day class kids. But I separated out the transitional kindergartners down at the bottom out all the school sites. So as you can see, the total amount, if we add those two together, is 14,508. I can tell you, since all the discussion about enrollment, we've been monitoring this every day since school started. We now are, today it was at 14,553 for a total enrollment. So we came up about 45 kids. Great. Any questions otherwise? This is an information item. Um, Dr. Sosko, Sosko, did you mean to put it on? Is this the right one? That's, that's the correct one. Okay. The outside. <laughs> you and me both. Okay. As someone who's done research all my, my life, th the only frustration I had with, with this sheet was there's no way to know what has occurred over the last couple of years. And I think it would be helpful for people to maybe 
to put in some columns showing the last three or four years. I realize maybe for individual schools you can't because there's been mergers and things, but some of the general numbers, whether it's by, you know, like like K through three or something like that, where you're you're not getting down to the individual school where you've you've done some things that might distort the numbers. So I think it'd be one of the, my questions is how has enrollment, you know, changed over the past three years, you know, and what are you doing to increase en enrollment, and do you have any evidence that the things that you're doing are starting to make a difference yet? Thank you. That was an information item. Any co questions, comments? Uh, Director Mumson. Um, thank you for that report. Um, okay, thank you. I, have a, I just have a, a question really quick. That information is available somewhere in this office, right, in this building. So yeah. I understand that Dr. LaTanya Durbany could probably give you that information very quickly. Dr. Shashol, if you are interested in you. connecting with her. You're welcome. Okay. Moving to the consent calendar, um, I'd like to pull 9.4. Uh, authorization to approve 2013-14 yearbook graduation and photographer vendor list. Any others? Madam President, I'd like to pull 9.3, 9.3, 9.5, 9.6, 9.7, 9.8, 9.9, 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, 9.13, 9.14, 9.15, 9.16, 9.17, 9.18, 9.19, 9.20, 9.21, 9.22, 
Mm -hmm. and it's to provide a fair playing field basically that everyone can have opportunities for access to the work and uh, we in this case have empowered the, the, the school sites to be able to do that judgment call to ensure that there's that that kind of fairness going on um, otherwise we'll come back down here and we'll just have to go down another path but again it's intended to create an, uh, a list here so the school sites can draw off of that. They've been vetted out for that list to be established. So that's the vendors for this year. Okay, I just want to make sure that it's clearly understood that there is no exclusive vendor at any school. Uh, Correct. And, and what the, the safety net on this one now mm -hmm. is that no contract can be Agreed, and it's illegal at the school sites. It needs to come down here for that approval. The designee, there's only about four or five of us out here. It's the business department, the superintendent, myself, and Sherry Summers um, are the only ones that are able to sign into a contract. And we'll be keeping an eye on that. Right now, they're coming to me. Okay. So if we suppose there's a violation and we have to move away from this, would it then be have to be put out to the lowest bidder? We would have to reel it contract. back in, and we'll have to make some decisions about how we want to do that. Um, okay. But again, right now, this is empowering an opportunity to, to you know, to for the sites can, to pick a vendor off this list, but it's not exclusive. I would recommend that they choose everyone on this list accordingly. Okay, okay. And have we communicated that to the sites? What's happening? Because is I've gotten several <laughs> questions about this particular issue. And um, you had explained it to me, and then they're saying they're being told something else. And it, I just think it's very important that uh, everyone understands that there is no exclusive right. contract. Actually, I have a I have a memo that was going to go out tomorrow, and I will add that one little sentence in there because it's pretty um, clear that it needs to be that way. Okay. Thank you. That was my only. All right. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, Director Mumson. Oops, there we go. My question is: uh, Is one of the one of these vendors uh, uh, an ex-campus uh, supervisor? I believe uh, is uh, Sean uh, Design. Yes, and I think those are the pictures that are in here. I uh, guess he's. I, I thought he had moved away. He still. He moved he's still back. Okay. He submitted, so we, we're, we're good. Right. So that, may I, Madam President, so let me understand this as clearly, because uh, a lot of conversation is going on. So for an example, any, any schools can select from any of these bullets? Correct. Okay. That's all I need clarification. These, this is the pool of vendors. And schools should use multiple vendors from this list. A single site should use multiple vendors from this list. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Moving on to 10.3. Uh, I'm sorry, 10.3, former um, <laughs> 9.5. Mandate thank you. Mandate block grants. Thank you, Madam President. Mm -hmm. um, I just need, again, clarification. Um, the, there are 216.6 million allotted to the mandate block grant program. Ms. Hart, is that correct? That is correct. That's okay. what it was in this year's governor's approved budget. And then only 41,000 is available for the for the uh, file, individual file claims? That is correct. Okay. And this school district decided to, to choose the con uh, I I filing individual claims? Uh, last year, uh, at the beginning of the 2012-13 year, the state said, we don't want you filing all these mandated cost claims where we come up with 
every single dollar of possible expense, and then they only fund a portion of it. So they instituted the block grant program last year and gave districts the choice of accepting it was about $26 per student to not file individual claims. Last year they funded $8 million for districts that filed individual claims and it's estimated that we would get probably about 155000 on a million dollars worth of claims. But theoretically, they still owe us the $845,000 balance. Now, whether or not we ever get it or not, maybe someday they'll settle. But constitutionally, they would owe us money. But last year, it was funded at $8 million for districts that filed individual claims. About 10% of the districts in the state continued to file individual claims. We were one of them. Uh, this year, and part of it was because there was no guarantee of the funding under the block grant for the other 90%. This year, the governor really wanted, under the new funding formula, for districts to quit filing all the individual claims and just to accept the block grant and not continue the constant litigation over mandates. <coughs> And so he put no money in the original budget for mandated claims. There's 41 mandates, and they came forward and said, you're constitutionally required to fund mandates, and so constitutionally you can't not fund them. And so the governor said, okay, I'll put $1,000 in the budget for each mandate just to meet my constitutional requirement. And so that's why, that's where the 41,000 came from. It's 41 mandates at 1,000 apiece. I think he didn't want to just put a dollar in and say $41, so he put 41,000. But in exchange, he's fully funding the block grant. So instead of doing partial funding for each, he's fully funding the block grant. And as far as I know, Every district that I've talked to that didn't go with the block grant last year is going this year because it would be 459000 for us. So you're right, they're very unusual numbers, the difference, but that was the reason. He really okay. wants to give us a financial incentive to quit filing the claims. Okay. Well, the, the, the second paragraph just threw me off because there was only 41,000 available, right. <laughs> and yet you're asking for 459,000. The, the 459,000 is our share of the 216 million. Okay. All right. So that's our I'll share take your word for it. of the 216. <laughs> Thank you. 10.4, Director Uvalde. Yes. Um, Sorry about this. Is Mr. Lane, I assume, is here. Just, just wanted to know what wood sleepers and wood blocks are like. What, what, what are they? I've, I've been, I've been running, walking around Hogan Middle School with interest in that what, what sidewalk, are? and I just wanted to know what wood know sleepers what a, and wood blocks. Want to know what a sleeper are. is? Okay, what a sleeper? Um, they have on roofs. Like for instance, you have your your roof substrate let's uh -huh. say your roof material to keep the equipment or any yeah basically any equipment from being directly on the roof they put what they call a sleeper which is a two by four four by four something that keeps it basically it's a four by four so that you can you know roof up to it put some flashing and stuff so it's the curb that keeps the equipment off the roof uh -huh. that's called a sleeper okay. That's my question, Madam President. Okay. Uh, 10.5, contracted services. Yes, on the last page, uh, 100, page 172, Kagan Professional Development Consultant. Uh, professional Development for St. Vincent, St. Catharines, and St. Basil's. Uh, how are we connected to those schools? I'm, I'm not clear. So or I'm not informed on that. Thank you. We, we received the federal funding 
So we're the local education agency that receives the federal um, funding for private schools. And so we have an obligation to allow them to have a, whatever students qualify for those services at those schools, we generate the money for them and then we are to distribute the money back okay. to them. So they selected professional development as a way to utilize those funding that comes to us for those students at those schools. Thank you, Madam President. That's, that's, those are all my questions answered. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will entertain a motion for 9.1, 9.2, and 9.7. Move to approve. Second. It has been moved and seconded that we approve 9.1, 9.2, and 9.7. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Those items are approved. Now we will have 10.1 through 10.5. I would I move to approve. I second that, Madam President. It has been moved to approve item 10.1 through 10.5. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? These items are approved. Um, community forum. We have some cards for the second community forum. Deborah Sears. Thank you for um, allowing some additional time. I mentioned earlier in my comments I wanted to talk a little bit more about confidentiality and um, videos of students fighting that were also posted on the Vallejo, Indipo <laughs> Vallejo Independent Bulletin. So I'll probably take more than three minutes, but hopefully not more than five. Um, Confidentiality. Um, this was a post about uh, the VEA delaying, uh, I guess, staff signing confidentiality agreements um, due to due process or just some more, I guess, partnership between the district and the VEA before this got rolled out to staff. My question about this and this delay, and hopefully it's not delayed anymore because that will be very upsetting to me, is we're now full service community schools. We have a wraparound services, we have health information all over our district and as a healthcare provider I was subjected to HIPAA and PHI and breaching that puts me directly in financial consequence and or jail <laughs> okay and I had to sign many confidentiality statements about not breaching that I know our school submit was surveyed and submitted history of our families mental health issues our physical health issues our criminal activity impacts. I am very concerned we don't have our staff on board with confidentiality and are not stepping up to say yes we're going to sign this but instead it becomes some kind of play between the union and the district. Due process will always happen to everyone in this school district and our policies say we're going to adhere to confidentiality. It is so much more important now. I would assume Kathy Hahn as a practitioner would know this also and could maybe speak to me to reassure me that the confidentiality, confidential information sitting at our school as we convert to this full service community school, it will not be breached by anyone. And what are the consequences? Are schools under HIPAA? Does FERPA give us enough? Where is this blend? Because I know this is all under Department of Health and Human Services ultimately at the federal government. So we're all players in the big game here. Education and healthcare are very intertwined. So I don't want to see different rules here and if there are then I need to talk to legislation or something. Student fight videos. I spoke with uh, Mr. Garman actually outside during the meeting about this and explained to him my concern about this. And videos to me, I had a little bit of a quandary because you know, when the ones have come out in our past year or two in our own district, you know, part of it is like, okay, this shows something. But, and I wasn't sure how to process it. it my gut told me this is sick to watch this is sick it exploits violence of children um, it's just I didn't know how to I still don't know how to express it really so I guess did you really need a visual aid to believe our students sorry I mean do we really need a video I mean I talked to my 11 year old son who was heading towards Vallejo High he wants to go to that gear robotics Academy first choice for him. So I said, but did you know these videos? He goes, well, that's just for attention, mom. Everybody wants to be on YouTube. 
I'm like, oh, okay. I said, but you know, what about your school? He goes, yeah. I go, do you need to see videos to know that fights happen at your school? No, I don't need to see videos, Mom. I went to high school, I've been in public school. I don't need videos to know that stuff happens on campus. It's just common sense. Believe your teachers and your students. Why do they have to prove it with a video? When my s children come to my house and tell me this is what happened, I believe them. I don't need to watch a video. I don't say, oh, go prove it to me, videotape it next time. I mean, Jesus Christ. So that's my kind of moral opinion on it. I understand this freedom of speech issue and things like that, but freedom of speech does not protect exploitation of children. Abuse, violence should not be allowed, and it creates very high risk to others. We already had suicides in the Bay Area because of videos about a high school student. Sad. It encourages the wrong attention. It glorifies the wrong people. It dishonors the past victims and current victims and future victims. And it offers no solution. It just tells us what we already know. And I've heard and seen enough about the violence. I just, anyway. And to me, it should just be equivalent to other illegal media. Child pornography is not allowed. Fights of videos should not be allowed. It just does nothing. So I wanted to ask the board, what do you think about it? Am I on the right page here? Am I being too, way too conservative for my liberal mentalities usually? Or it's just, I'm, I don't know. So I also know there was the lawsuit last month at the last meeting in this um, the thing that I noted on it was there was a note about does one through 100 that were listed um, as, uh, I guess, defendants <laughs> or whatever. What, can you clarify a little bit more about what that means? Are these the bystanders that stood around at this incident? Is this like a case that will set a standard in California that this is not acceptable at our schools to videotape? The other question I have Again, related to my healthcare experience, videotaping in hospitals is not allowed. Doctors can't do it for their research. They can't do it because they want to show their son how to do surgery. They can't do it because, ooh, I want to see that. P patients can't do it. You have to have permission, specific, explicit permissions. And those videos are, the, are owned by that hospital. The records are owned by the hospital, not the patient on anybody. Is that, is that similar in education? When something is happening on our campus, isn't that the school's ownership of that? Does it become part of the student record electronically? And it's not just out there. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I'd appreciate some feedback tonight. Or bring it up as a study session or a discussion or another board agenda to help educate our public about doing the right thing. In my hallway discussion with Mr. Garman, I told him that I believe the VIB and this poster, whoever did it, pretty much jumped the shark with their credibility by leaving these links on the comments section. And we had a little back and forth, and I told him to basically take them down. I'm not watching your newspaper anymore, and I will encourage nobody else to watch it. He then came to me, and he, he told me his rationale as to why, and I get it but I still think there's a higher moral ethical issue here. And, uh, but anyway, he agreed that he would remove the post to the links. So thank you, Mr. Garman, for having, listening to me and, and uh, protecting our students. Thank you. Can I just comment? Okay. Forgive me. Okay, Dr. May Bishop. May I? Um, President Wilson, Vice President, Dr. Ubaldi, trustees, community, parents, students, staff. The Vallejo City Unified School District Board Policies, which for are vetted and approved by this board, are aligned not only with federal law, but with state law. We adhere to FERPA, we also adhere to HIPAA. Whether someone signs that they have received the information or not, 
adherence to the board policies and the law is non-negotiable. When it comes to ignoring board policy and the law, the employee subjects themselves to individual liability. Therefore, let me be clear. It is the case that all of our administrators, as well as many of our teachers, have signed that they attended the confidentiality presentation. Our annual notification this year, there are things that we are obligated to um, inform our staff of every year by law, but also what we've done is picked out certain policies that over the last two and a half years, people have chosen to ignore. And the ignoring of these policies will subject people to, uh, there is no one under the, in the state that won't have due process rights. That's what you get as a subject of your employment. But ignoring federal and state law will land people in some serious trouble. Our students are not fodder for whatever people think they're fodder for. They have protections just as staff has protections. And under no circumstances will we back away from supporting the rights of our students, which are codified in Vallejo City Unified School District Board policy. My staff, my administrative team will take, has and will continue to take this very seriously. Let me say with regard to the social media policies, we've started to look at best practices. There are policies in place around social media and we're also looking at best practice policies. The board has given a mandate to me to take a look at those things because we must do better with regard to what is on websites and so forth. Student taping under our board policies is prohibited as well. Thank you for asking the questions. I have four. Mustafa Abdubani, and I'll get to, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, mark after Mustafa and then Ms. Watts, and just feel, make sure you fill the card out at the end. Um, Madam President, I just want to mention, um, just uh, ask the board to give some consideration one item, uh, and that's um, currently when the, when the community wants to uh, communicate with the board uh, by email uh, or with the district by email, what they do is they, uh, they click on a contact uh, link on the district's website and uh, that link brings up an email to a district employee rather than to the board or to the district. And so the concern is, is that there may be some confusion about who uh, the community actually wants to communicate with. And so the request is, is that the, the board give some consideration to creating a email for the board that says something like uh, a school board at uh, k12.ca.us, Vallejo k12.ca.us, and the same thing for the district. And uh, then the same employee can open the email and decide to send it to the board, but it would just be clear who the email is to uh, in the case of the district or the, or the board, rather than sending it to individual board members. It's important to understand that sometimes the community may want to communicate with the board as an entity rather than with individual board members and then look for perhaps uh, whether or not that communication will be responded to. And the same thing may exist for the district. So I would ask the board to consider that and to, uh, uh, to uh, at least give me some feedback as to what that consideration mm -hmm. might be. Thank you. I, I think, you know, it's a good suggestion. I just, we need just, I need, just need clarification as to whether that would in any way violate the Brown Act. So, you know, we just want to be legal, that's all. So, uh, but we certainly can, uh, do research. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gorman. 
Hello? Hello. I just want to uh, make just a couple things clear. First of all, uh, the videos that were posted on VIB were posted by a member of the public. These are not videos that we put up as content. They're not videos that we endorse. Uh, second thing, I did listen to Ms. Sears and her concerns, and they've already been removed, so they're no longer there. Um, the post is there saying there are YouTube videos, but all the links have been removed. You guys should know there are hundreds of these sort of videos on YouTube. The reason I allowed that to stay was so that people could see that that does exist. I understand the concerns. I did remove it. It's not something we support, promote, endorse, or specifically encourage, nor would I allow VIB to become a platform for that. When I saw it, my initial feeling was that it's a one-time thing. I'm not going to let somebody start posting fight videos on a regular basis using the website as a platform. After listening to Ms. Sears, I decided that the point had already been made. There's no gain in leaving those videos posted. They're no longer there. They've been removed. So I hope that we'll continue to see further discourse about the schools. And just so you guys understand, that those videos were not something that I or VIB, not that we have staff, but it's not something that we posted as content. It was posted by a viewer, and it's already been removed. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Watts. Good evening, board. Um, I'm a parent first. I have three children who attended public schools. And so I take confidentiality of all of our kids very, very seriously. Um, my daughter has had some mental health issues that, that she shares. And I will tell you that if a teacher had ever divulged that particular piece of information, the school district in Fairfield would have seen a mama bear in full presence. And you guys have seen me in that mode. And it's not always a very pretty picture. So I'm going to say at the outset that VEA absolutely supports a confidentiality agreement. Um, our only concern was that, number one, it had not been brought to us prior to it being released. And so immediately, I, when I did see it, um, I knew that there were going to be questions. And so I raised those concerns. And so we do have some concerns in making sure that our teachers, our members, know that their rights are protected, that there is due process. And so we just need clarification, and that I think once we have that, uh, that agreement reached, that VEA will be the first one to say that this is something that we support. Um, we do support it, and we just need some clarification on some particulars. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. Director Waterman. Thank you. Um, I've been a little out of the loop lately, so I'd like some clarification around this. Um, these are trainings that all of our teachers have had. And at the beginning of every training, teachers sign in. Am I correct? And they sign out to prove that they were there to receive the information. And once they've received the information as a policy of the district, is it really important that they sign this paper? Because it strikes me that they've already agreed through their employment contract that they are responsible for that. Yes. So signing is simply another layer of accountability, mm -hmm. um, which all of administrators have taken. And it's just it, through good auditing practices, that's typically what occurs. Mm -hmm. um, but not signing doesn't mean that they're not responsible for the information. Right. So and. Um, th it was clearly expressed to those um, employees at these trainings that these are board policies and ed code. The training included um, cite numerous ed code citations. Okay. So everyone understands the, the penalties, basically, of choosing to not follow ed code. There will be clarification in a letter that will be issued from my office on tomorrow. Okay. And um, the issue of freedom of speech is an interesting one. Um, of course, if unless the person who videotaped that child ran up to that kid and asked for a photo release form to be signed, I don't see how they get to use that as their own speech. 
But perhaps this would be a really interesting study session. We could get Dora to come do a presentation on this world of, um, I think it would be very powerful and interesting and hopefully clarify some of the issues that our community might be getting tripped up on. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. We've learned a lot, and so I think it's good for us to talk about it. And this is the new frontier. I mean, speech is important. No one's going to de deny that. Um, child safety, bullying, big hot topic, right? We take it very seriously. We've had many, many, many study sessions around this issue. And now that we have even more public interest, perhaps it's a great opportunity for us to have a study session with Dora in particular. Thank you. Kind of to follow up with your statement about signing in and signing out. Well, that signing in at the beginning of the day Someone may leave and come back. They're still, they're still, they're still responsible. Yes, they're still responsible, but having that as the only layer is not sufficient. You, we really need uh, Perhaps a pop more. quiz. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, when we did our training at IRS, um, it was done online, and at the end, uh, you did have a pop, you did have a quiz, s and if you went, and it was a time training, so if you f just thought you would go fly through the training and sign it at the end, no. They would send you back through it, and then you'd have to take the little test and everything, and, and you had to pass it, and then you were uh, cleared for that year. So yes, it's a very common uh, thing to do because it is so important uh, uh, to make sure that everybody has up-to-date information because laws change also. So that's another reason why for doing it. Okay, um, let me see, Director Mumson. I have a request uh, regarding the LCFF presentation this evening. I would like uh, an electronic copy of panel number 11 that is entitled Treatment of Categorical Programs under LCFF. It's in little tiny print, uh, the smallest print. He needs large Thank print format. <laughs> well yes. Thank you. But we have an electronic copy, and that way we can enlarge it to what we yeah, want it to be. You can just send it to me now. Okay. No. Director Waterman. Thank you. I, I think we've already skipped ahead to the future board so. agendas. <laughs> so I have two, only two, Berkey. Relax. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important, since it was brought up today, and the issue of how uh, successfully and effectively we broadcast our meetings, I think I'd like some clarity from Mike or from whoever in IT can give us the heads up about what it is from our perspective, Marcus shared his perspective, what it is from our perspective that could be causing a glitch. Obviously, it's our, responsible, our responsibility between VCAT, the district and VCAT, to make sure that that's of a clear flow of information. So I'd like a report on that soon. I know that we're working on it. Um, and honestly, I'd also like an update on our academies. We've got all these new academies rolling out. We have all these new excited kids who are jazzed about it. I, I'd like to know how we're, I'd like to just know how we're doing. I know that it's going to be bumpy. But I'm particularly concerned and interested to hear about how we're working towards um, maintaining the robotics program at Vallejo High School. Thank you. Any other? Upcoming agenda items. Um, announcement for the upcoming meeting. Um, we have on here the grand jury um, meeting, basically, for uh, September the 4th. I would like to, um, because of other scheduling uh, conflicts, I would like to move that to October. I'm sorry. I know I've said September all the way through, but we have had... Uh, uh, so many meetings and and everything so um, if we could choose an October date um, I would like that at Vallejo High School is that okay with the board yeah when's the deadline for us to we have responded very and good you missed the last meeting yes okay and we met the response and that would also give them time to digest 
what was presented to them so that if they wanted to come back with any further comments or questions. Mm -hmm. Anything else? If not, this meeting is adjourned.